And without further ado, the Psychology of Sorcery panel. All right, thank you everybody for gathering here on this Tuesday evening. Um, so we have a few interesting panelists. I'm very excited for this discussion. Uh, I will be hosting and moderating the discussion. My name is Dan. Uh, I'm a student of cognitive science and philosophy here at the University of Toronto. I'm still finishing my undergrad, but hoping to uh, procure some ideas from this and work on uh, similar things in the future. Uh, altered states of consciousness, mysticism, uh, philosophy, all of those are fascinating subjects which uh, inform my perspective on cognitive science. Um, I won't talk too much about myself, um, as I am just here to uh, facilitate for the other panelists. Uh, I think you guys can probably introduce yourselves better than I do. Uh, presumably you know yourself to some degree. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> Do any of us really? Well, exactly. That's the problem. Uh, we'll find out. Uh, so, Anderson, do you want to... Sure, let us know a bit about yourself. Uh, hi, so I'm Anderson Todd. Uh, I um, have a very similar wheelhouse to Dan, actually. So um, I have a long-term interest in magic, altered states of consciousness, including sort of a lucid uh, dream in terms of uh, psychotechnology, spiritual technologies. My background is in cognitive science. I teach here uh, at the university in cognitive science. So I teach uh, the Intro to Cog Sci course. I teach consciousness. Uh, and I also teach in interdisciplinary courses on uh, Jungian theory. Um, so I teach the core course there, and I teach hypotheses of the unconscious. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of my, my own work, uh, in many ways, um, being here is in uh, sort of a, a culminating practice for me. Uh, I've spent 10 years kind of kicking my way uphill to make magic something we can actually talk about without people looking at us like we're nuts. Um, so, uh, so yeah, this is uh, quite exciting for me. Hi, I'm Jun Sung. I'm a uh, PhD student in the Wisdom and Identity Lab up at uh, OISE. I'm also the uh, manager of the Consciousness and Wisdom Studies Lab that uh, Anderson helps run. Um, I guess my background is also in cognitive science, along with uh, a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of uh, religion. But uh, I guess as far as magic goes, I actually kind of fell into this topic by accident. Um, because I'm interested in ways that you can facilitate the development of humans' higher cognitive processes. Things like wisdom, creativity, rationality, and stuff like that. Uh, I find too many people study individual differences in these things or random life experiences and how they facilitate them as opposed to, you know, things that we can actually do to uh, hack the source code, as it were. Um, so first I ended up in fortune telling as a way to accelerate pattern recognition, and then I kind of just fell off the wagon from there. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Katrina Pejovic. I'm a first year master's student here at the University of Toronto at the Department for the Study of Religion. And I completed my undergraduate here also concentrating in philosophy. Um, and magic has always been a major passion of mine. It's something that I've studied extensively in my personal life and also academically. I'm currently working on a thesis on Kabbalah. And um, I also just do a lot of work in general with respect to magic in the Christian tradition, the history of European magic, um, witchcraft trials, and also looking at new world traditions, including modern phenomena like the Hermetic Order of Golden Dawn, Thelema as a social movement, and also looking at some Afro-Caribbean and Afro-Brazilian traditions, including Kimbanda. Great, thanks. So, um, just to let you all know as well, uh, the format for this is going to be generally an open discussion between um, us here up front, but at the last half an hour or so, I'm going to open it up for discussions from the audience, and we'll have a bit of back and forth that way. Uh, so if you have any questions that arise during this, note them down, and there will be a chance for you to get those out at the end. So, magic is a very broad term, so I want to start perhaps narrowing it down, especially for people who are unfamiliar with this. This may be the first time a lot of people are coming into contact with this as a legitimate phenomenon. Uh, so I'm interested in each of your personal understandings of magic uh, and the various traditions that inform your um, either practice or theory on magic. Uh, so if you want to give that a go first, Anderson? Sure. Um, so I try uh, really hard to deliberately vary my metaphysics on the day of the week. So given that it's Tuesday, I have a pretty strong commitment today to um, you know, the, the naturalistic imperative and a certain amount of materialism. So I'm going to leave aside uh, any spooky action at a distance in my metaphysics, but uh, let me just say off the bat that I try to hold my metaphysics very, very loosely, so I'm much opener to weirdness, I think, than uh, many people who are my colleagues. However, that aside, um, I came to magic uh, in, in a fairly roundabout, eclectic way, I think, as many people do. 
Um, so I found a real affinity with it as a kid, and uh, given that I grew up before the dawn of the internet and the dark ages of card catalogs and stuff, it just meant that I had to ransack the local library for every like stray bit of occultism that I could lay my hands on, and that was liberally mixed together with everything that I could find on cryptography and Bigfoot. Um, so, uh, you know, I ended up with a sort of hodgepodge of material uh, off the bat, um, but it was material that really spoke to me. Um, and the idea that there was a sort of long-standing, uh, at the time primarily I was thinking of it as Western, so a fairly long-standing Western tradition that went back to Neoplatonism, right? This was the kind of thing that you could dredge up by reading between the lines in Ripley's Believe It or Not. So Neoplatonism, for the unfamiliar, what's oh, yeah. the historical period? Okay, so so think of it, so the descendants of Plato, so this is like uh, late, late classics period and then a resurgence, um, you know, when, when these texts get recovered uh, during the, the Renaissance and into the Enlightenment. Um, so, you know, originally speaking, I was doing, like I said, with a real hodgepodge of stuff. Um, when I sort of settled into magical practice from kind of 10 to 12 and started doing things fairly regularly, um, I was fairly settled on a, a Western tradition circling around kind of Golden Dawn material. So it was uh, Kabbalah, so Jewish mysticism, although through a Christian uh, mystic lens. Um, a fair bit of Goetic stuff, so um, demon summoning, uh, Abramelin. Um, for those of you that, that know that stuff. Um, and I was very concerned with a fairly narrow kind of constrained ritual practice. Um, then I became a teenager, and so uh, I hit uh, chaos magic uh, pretty full force at the time, and that was having a fair resurgence. So chaos magic, um, in contrast, really hits um, the notes of kind of um, individual construction, the idea that you can take hold of your own worldview and world system that you can kind of kit bash together, um, you know, God systems of belief, spiritual technologies, and you can pull from everywhere. Um, and so that appealed to me enormously, and that deeply informed my practice for uh, many years. And since then, um, I've kind of come back around in many ways to a more traditional uh, take on things, although I imagine we'll get into that um, in more depth. So my current ideas about magic are filtered partly through cognitive science, partly through Jungian psychology, and I'm a practicing uh, clinician, I'm in private practice, uh, so it also is informed by things that I see uh, in sort of therapeutic session quite often. But my current definition would run something like this, if we're going naturalistically. Uh, magic is a set of psychotechnologies which volitionally, although not always consciously, allows you to gain control over your mental states and states of identity. And so the way that that cashes out is that sometimes that's conscious, sometimes it's unconscious, but it is volitional. So that is that sometimes you are setting up practices which allow you to constrain your mental events in such a way as things are out of your control but moving in the direction that you want. That's one thing. And it gives you sort of a degree of interior control over wide states of consciousness, including various kinds of mystical states, um, right, and having sort of access to those on command, as it were, but also to states of identity. Uh, and that's very important. And all of that is rolled together with sort of a broad, broader machinery of imagination. Now, saying off the bat that I have a naturalistic slant on this because it's Tuesday, it's also important to note that when you start to bend your personal ontology and metaphysics with these kinds of techniques, it has effects on your perspective and worldview that, regardless of what you think about what's actually happening metaphysically, definitely come off as supernatural. And the thing is that very rapidly you learn, I think, when you're in, deep in on these practices, that you do things, and inhabiting the magical worldview in the way that these things can push you into can represent a huge and radical change to yourself, how you see things, how events are configured for you, right? And in a much more sort of focused and instrumental way, uh, I think, than, um, you know, sort of uh, other sorts of psychotechnologies and practices like, say, mindfulness meditation, where you're just kind of clear out. In this case, you're trying to do things. Um, so I would say that's, that is in the main sort of where my, my thinking on it lands. But, you know, we're in the middle of a working group right now, so that's all in flux. Okay. So, hold, hold oh, yeah. on, you were okay. seven yeah, yeah. demons at 12, though? <clears throat> Ten. Ten. What did your parents think of this? Um, my parents, uh, my mother is a heretical Catholic, uh, and my father is nominally Anglican insofar as he's English, but in fact he's just a science fiction fan pothead. So <laughs> my parents were pretty liberal. Um, to be honest, when I talked about it, I never talked about this stuff with my dad, but when I talked about it with my mom, she was generally 
as she often is of my weirdness, quite uh, encouraging. Uh, and, you know, I explained to her, it's like, look, it's not, you know, when we're talking about demon summoning, this is what we're talking about. And it's not necessarily malevolent, it's about getting control of these aspects of yourselves and trying to, in a sense, befriend the forces of darkness, because then they're not forces of darkness, blah, 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 blah. And she bought in. I don't know if that contributes to her being a heretic, but she was generally fairly supportive. Possibly. Yeah. Um, now, as a child, we're all more imaginative. I'm wondering if before you took this naturalistic slant, or perhaps always you've had this naturalistic slant, did you have experiences where perhaps your imagination went awry as a result of interacting with something you weren't perhaps ready for? Sure, all the time. Um, that still happens. I just have to come up with naturalistic explanations for that. Um, yeah, I mean, for sure. So, I did, a, uh, I did a, a makeshift ritual one time, uh, you know, very, very much in the mold of chaos magic when I was like uh, 15 or 16, where I was sort of basing it on the notion of uh, running the wild hunt. Uh, and I had a terrifying, an absolutely terrifying experience, which was very difficult to explain um, at the time. Now, my suspicion is, I mean, if I was going to run it naturalistically, that, you know, my consciousness got bent around in such a way as that I, whatever, misinterpreted, or, you know, my sense of space was confused. But, like, the sense that things were after me and actively moving, right, in, in a particular kind of way, and I mean physical things, trees, animals, and stuff, was very strong. So, yeah, I mean, I launched myself into, into a state that I think at the time I was maybe ill-prepared for the intensity of. If you want a little taste of that at some point, by the way, there's a fun game I like to recommend to people called Werewolf. So the next time you're camping, when you're out in the woods, if it's relatively level ground, um, walk out until you can barely see the campfire, right? Like walk out into the woods. And then start hightailing it back towards the fire at maximum speed. And very rapidly, in my experience, you will have the sensation of something chasing you. I don't know whether it just triggers some kind of primitive mammalian fleeing circuit or something. Uh, see, I have to find naturalistic explanation. But you will have this sense that there is something right on your heels. So if you want a really intense fear experience, if you happen to go in for that sort of thing, um, yeah, I highly recommend it. So it was sort of like that, but amped up and layered together with like uh, hallucinations of various kinds and yeah, it was a pretty pretty mind-bending experience. What snapped you back? I got to the end. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> was it a meaningful resolution, or was it something you just had to wait until it kind of ran its energy out of your psyche? No, no, I mean, you know, it was a well-constrained situation, right? It, it had sort of you know, terminal positions that were laid out in the bargain ahead of time. And so the idea was that if I could run the course successfully, there were certain kinds of benefits that would accrue to me, and if I failed to do so, um, I, I guess I would be badly hurt, um, and uh, you know I got pretty scuffed up and scratched up, but uh, you know I made it through to the end zone. So right, yeah, and then it pretty much dropped off. But it was a very instructive lesson in how powerful a ritually constructed circumstance could alter my mind without anything else in my system. And so the pragmatic lesson from that is always set clear boundaries around the ritual space. Yeah, yeah. If, well, and just generally, like if you're gonna monkey around with this stuff, just don't monkey around with this stuff. It's, I mean, not to say that you shouldn't engage in it, but you should recognize that it is a tool and not a toy. Uh, and you should, you know, realize that uh, regardless of what your position is sort of on the overall metaphysics of what's going on, that you can get yourself very deep into a situation very quickly. Uh, and so, yeah, all of the standard stuff, banishing, grounding, setting boundaries, uh, you know, making sure you constrain the space. And like, you know, calling your friends up and telling them, hey, if I don't make it back by midnight, come and search the woods for me, like that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, safety first. Excellent. Good yeah. responsible note to start off on. Yeah. Uh, I want to jump over to Katarina, because I know um, the three of us have more of a similar perspective from perhaps having talked more. Uh, so, how do you conceive of magic? So, being in a department for the study of religion is very amusing because we don't have an official definition of religion. Um, you know, it's like, is it, is it a belief system, or is that more Protestant, is it about rituals, is it about embodied behavior, affective, um, emotional interpretations of religion, is it about texts, or is that also too much of a Christian perspective, and so on. And, and the same really applies to magic. If we're, for a long time, in scholarship, it was really a pejorative word, like, th this is official religion, which is good, and then magic is superstition, it's bad, you know, it's what people who aren't really religious are, in, you know, engaging in, because they're heretics, or they're blasphemers, and so on. And um, my interest in it came from a pretty much immediately, like as, as soon as I started to read 
um, especially growing up in Serbia, where there's an abundance of folklore and witchcraft stories. And to this day, there are witchcraft traditions that continue to be practiced by people who identify fully as Christian, as most people accused of witchcraft historically have been. Um, and, but they, they have a way of reconciling it with Orthodox Christianity and seeing it as a part of a continuation of certain ancestral practices and folkloric fairy beliefs and so on. And um, that was a major influence on me growing up. It was something that always fascinated me to hear these stories and to have family who lives in rural, more rural areas where this stuff is much more widespread. And of course, when I learned English and I came to Canada and I started reading all about, you know, also like um, Anderson, you know, chaos magic and uh, hermetic magic and looking at Platonism and Neoplatonism and the thread of Iamblichus that runs all the way to the Renaissance area with Agrippa and also, of course, the Holy Guardian Angel and the Evermillion ritual or something that I'm Can you historically fascinated. orient us on Iamblichus? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so Iamblichus was, you know, he, he is a Neoplatonist who's writing very much contemporaneously with the early Christian movement and, in fact, he was a major... Um, not necessarily opponents, but the Christians that perceive him as a voice that they need to contend against because he was offering a pagan theurgy, essentially. It wasn't just merely Platonic like philosophy. Now you had an element of ritual also embedded into it. And, um, and so, of course, you know, the one thing that I've also been very fascinated by is the Abermellon ritual, as I'm currently editing a book um, on that topic by um, George Den, who wrote the New German edition. Uh, from, which it's the German manuscript was finally translated recently. And yeah, so witchcraft, folklore, all these things really fascinate me, and it's something that I've also been interested in looking at the way that occult subcultures have understood magic over time and how it's changed. So in the era of chaos magic, it was very much a psychological phenomenon um, and a way of engaging this particular spirits, conceived as spirits, which are parts of your mind that you are engaging with on a very deep level through certain ritual parameters that you construct. And now in the current, like, at least in the circles that I run, really, um, the modern kind of trend has been to go back to what's called a spirit model, which understands spirits as objective uh, beings that can exist with outer minds, um, perceiving them, and that have their own agency and so on. And this comes from a greater contact primarily with um, ATR, ATRs, with African tribal religions or African traditional religions, such as voodoo, palo, sentinela, <coughs> and um, umbanda and so on, where you have, or candomblé, where you have a very direct visceral experiences of spirits possessing people and spirits manifesting in certain ways. So, you know, if when I speak to people from Umbanda, for example, they, they would never, like, agree that it's a part of their mind. They would say, well, you know, the spirit possesses the person, they act differently, like, that's just... It's, or, like, they can manifest physically and move objects in the room. Like, these are things that I'm not... I don't see how this relates to anything internal. Whereas then you have people who are synthesizing these two things and saying, well, maybe the imagination is the, is the realm in which spirit contact takes place. So all these things are major interests of mine anthropologically as I study this. And um, when it comes to personal definitions, as I said, it's very difficult um, because you have different styles of historically the way the magic has been studied. There are so many different ways of understanding it. Um, if I'm correct, Kikifer, um who wrote Magic in the Middle Ages, has this dichotomy between natural magic, which is like astrology or understanding things like alchemy, which were considered science at the time. So you have things like the understanding the occult or hidden virtues of plants and animals and combining them in certain ways to achieve certain effects. And then you have demonic magic, which involves summoning evil spirits, essentially, or as, as they're understood in the Christian tradition, to affect things. And then you, but of course that's been totally disputed, and there's people who talk about operative versus uh, mystical. So operative is like a folk's charm. Like often when you read folk manuals, you have things like this will get you money, this will help you find treasure, this will get you a lover. You know, and so if you do the spell to get a lover, and it brings you someone like that that you wanted, then it, it worked. But if it doesn't, then it failed. So it's very much like a, it's an almost experimental kind of magic where you want to see, well, did I really bring me the money that I asked for, or did nothing happen? And if it did bring me the money, did it bring me the exact amount I asked for? Um, and if not, how can I improve it? And so on. Uh, whereas there's a mystical dimension to it too, where you're looking to experience spirits for the sake of having those experiences, for the sake of um, entering mystical states, of <coughs> um, nurturing a greater understanding in yourself of the way that the world works, of, of communing with angels, such as through the Heptameron grimoire, in order to actually gain more insights into God, into the way that things were. Many early magicians were actually like Christian abbots and, and priests uh, who, who did this in monasteries and had access to grimoires and were literate. And so they would read these and they would think that they're doing basically a service to God, essentially, because they're learning to use the name of Jesus to bind demons and elevate them in a certain way and constrain them again to speak intelligibly and not lie to you in the triangle that you summon them in. So all these are major interests. 
What is magic to me? Frankly, I'm still like we're still developing that. Obviously, it's it's a, it's a lifelong project, but I do see an important dimension in probability um, enhancement. In it's a, it's a kind of technology to enhance um, so the probability or the chances of certain things arising. So just you know, getting the lover, did, did they come or did they not? Or is it maybe there was a 10% chance that you would meet that person, but that was an 80% chance? It's it's about finding certain sweet spots, which is also often how certain chaos magicians refer to it. But then there's also just deeply mystical aspects to it too, where you're looking to commune with particular entities um, and understand them. And it's also important to to kind of get at the idea of whatever, some people use magic very pejoratively still. And some scholars prefer to use the term ritual technology, because then, you know, in the Catholic Mass, when you have the blood turning into, sorry, the wine turning into the blood of God, you know, um, that's one thing, that's religion, but then we have someone who's reciting a very particular, let's say, even a psalm, or a particular incantation, over some of their blessing to consecrate, to make it a different thing now, to make it a suitable vessel for a particular spirit, um, that's magic. You know, and it depends on what sometimes has institutional authority. Um, even in ancient Babylon, you had you know, official priests who served the state and who served their king, and they were you know, ritual magicians, I guess we could understand them that way, but they were also called priests. And then you had shamans who lived in villages who were considered to be evil in a sense because they weren't directly tied to the government. And so it's important to kind of note what gets called magic and is often a power, a politics of power. Even in my home country, what's called witchcraft is usually a negative thing entirely. It's, it's a way to say those people do bad things. You know, maybe we do very similar practices, but at least we're, we're right with God, essentially. And so it's, again, it's a, it's a hesitation and tension in the scholarship of magic that's important to keep account of because, um, so that's why sometimes I prefer the term ritual technology to describe. You know, it allows us to incorporate official religious rituals that have particular transformative effects and follow under certain patterns like that, and not necessarily deprivilege um, what folk healers do, or what um, charismatic healers do, or what particular people who are parts of faith groups, or um, what, what are called like essentially spirit possession traditions that um, don't have a lot of governmental support in the areas that they operate and are considered heretical or blasphemous or essentially marginalized. That way it can kind of validate that you know, the techniques aren't really like fundamentally that different if we look at them as purely techniques. So yeah, I do think there's an element of probability enhancement. I think there's an important element of spirit communion and, um, and actually gaining insight from spirits as you, as you summon them. And, um, and overall, it's just an ongoing journey for me to basically discover these things and to interrogate them and to hopefully um, make something of an academic practice out of it in terms of actually working with that in my grad school experience. Thanks. I have one follow-up question mm -hmm. that is strikingly as relevant because we have a similar theme in uh, both of these positions where there is some sort of difficulty in defining the phenomena, mm -hmm. some intrinsic uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if you have any comments about this notion of the uncertainty of what the phenomena is and does that ha bear any relation to the efficacy of magic? Like, is it necessary that perhaps because of the probabilistic nature of mm -hmm. uh, the phenomena that we need to not pin ourselves down to axioms that are too certain? I think that's a good idea because um, ultimately because the affective dimension, the experiential dimension, is so intrinsic, especially to the mystical side of it. When you get folk magic, you know, like I said, sometimes I've, I've listened to folk magicians discuss this with each other, and they say, well, or even root workers, for example, in the hoodoo tradition in America, and they would say, well, you know, it, we just figure out who's better by who has the better chance of success, right? You know, this person, whenever they do this one thing, they, it always comes to them, so, you know, he's obviously have a, has a particular talent for that or has discovered a particular technique. He knows the right root, he knows how to sing to it, how to make it alive, and how to put it in the right way in a mojo hand or in a candle working to really make that work. And other people... Um, and they don't really bicker over definitions because, in, in fact, there's a reason that they often call it work. And, and it's because they don't really see it as something separate from, like, sweeping a floor, usually. That's, that's how I've been told. You know, it's, the, um, it's all just work that you're trying to do for particular goals. Um, but I do think it's, it's useful to have a certain element of epistemic uncertainty about it because, not just in the definitions themselves, because that's a, an issue of scholarship, um, but also in taking seriously and... Um, uh, the accounts of practitioners and people who speak to you and inform us in anthropology um, because you know you're never really going to get a super synthesized definition from any of them in fact you know um, often and that's what's true with any religion really you know if you go into a space with let's say five um, modern people like let's say chaos magicians and you ask them to define it and they'll get five different maybe six different answers you know one of them will change their mind at some point and, and i think that's a fruitful thing i think it's an, it's an excellent creative tension that exists in this field and it's what makes it exciting and interesting and i think that um 
in general, it's useful to not be so held down by it, especially as you pointed out. You know, there's a, there's an element of failure. You know, some people, even people who truly and honestly work with it, like even in root work, know that it doesn't always work. You know, because that you know, like no doctor's procedure will cure the particular disease every time either. Right? You know, they 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 are working to perfect their craft, but they understand that you know everything in life misfires. Right? You know, the, the best lawyer in the world will get some cases that they're going to lose. And so um, I think that taking into account like the the seriousness of what they're reporting to you as if you're doing anthropology, um, while also understanding that you know it is um, it's not a thing where like if something doesn't work it's like aha this is proved you're all like loonies right you know it's actually like well you know they they acknowledge that possibility themselves right you know they're playing with particular forces which are generally seen as invisible they're trying to understand how to work with them more efficiently and better and. Um, it's just, it's too difficult and too perhaps not helpful, not just from a scholarly perspective, but just from a person-to-person -person perspective with informants, to try and really be like, ah, so what you really mean is this, right? You know, I'm from this other tradition, or like, I've also studied this other form, and like, that's what you mean, right? Like, let's not put that into boxes, let's just really enjoy the plurality and the fascinating multiplicity of these sorts of effects, and, um, because I think that's one of the most exciting things about it. So, if two magicians from vastly divergent mm -hmm. traditions came together, they would likely be able to perhaps agree that they're doing something similar even if the languages they're using to describe them are somewhat different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In fact, that's been um, one of the fascinating conversations I've been taking place in recently is between um, a Japanese omyoro, so he, he practices omyoji, um, and he's actually like paid by the state of Japan to do that, um, and a Western ritual magician who works Croatia. And they've been finding that, you know, like they can discuss techniques and they can say, ah, we do this binding ritual too. Yes, we actually try and get spirit to manifest physically in this location and we use this particular way to do it, you know, and, and they like kind of share particular um, insights together. But, you know, they are totally with, embedded within their own traditions. They have ways to talk to each other. They don't need to agree on everything because they're just interested in basically learning about each other's crafts. Kind of like when you get crafts people together and they're just like, well, we're not really from the same exact way. We didn't, we didn't learn it the same way. Our teachers weren't the same. But, you know, it's interesting to hear your techniques. So there's something fruitful that comes out yeah, of the dialogue. Absolutely. Of, well, maybe this is something what, like what you're doing, yeah, but yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. not in a scholarly mm -hmm. effort, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Cool. Nice. Now, there's a lot of themes in here I want to return to, <laughs> yeah. but we'll let Jin Sung have his say. So before I start, um, there is a gentleman with a cane and a goatee who will have at least one other person with him <coughs> stuck somewhere in the lobby trying to get in here. Can somebody go looking for him, please? Huh. <laughs> Wait, which lobby? No idea. <laughs> you only got two. Goatee and a cane. There's a demon somewhere. There's Lucifer himself upon us. <laughs> I don't know how he'd take that, actually. Well, we'll find out soon. Okay. Um, you sent somebody for the mission? <laughs> you sent somebody for the mission? Yes. Okay. Okay, cool. I meant the lobby in this bit, but anyway. Um, so, I guess I'm probably the only one who's going to start out with an actual, uh, with, uh, an actual definition of magic. And I guess the uh, way that we seem to be going about this is uh, getting into our own history and background and stuff like that. So, uh, I'm going to start with the definition of uh, magic is not a toy. I, I, that, that's something that you know Anderson and I have talked about this previously, but I think is worth reiterating is um, bending your cognitive processes and consciousness, or bending other people's cognitive processes and consciousness in various ways, is not something you do recreationally. Okay? Like um, one of the things that you will find about magic is that they're always Im magical practices are always embedded in some sort of greater system. There's a lot going on there. It's Honestly, it's like I'm kind of surprised Anderson's alive and sane. <laughs> um, I hope you don't take offense to that. Alive. <laughs> Fair enough. For the class that I took with him, he also brought his brain toys in and was like, here is how I electrically stimulate my brain. Here's the froth that I drink to drink really well. So, for some context. Tell me about the froth. <laughs> <laughs> oh good, the summoning ritual worked. Hey Ross. <laughs> Welcome Ross. Um, Alright, so I'm probably the only person on this panel who, one, didn't end up in magic on purpose, and two, did not come to it from the Western tradition. Because um, I ended up in the whole magic pile when uh, my supervisor called me in for a meeting and said, uh, alright, so uh, you have to uh, do some uh, independent reading courses for your graduate degree. You can do it for, uh, you can do the literature review for your thesis like everybody else, 
Or you can sort through this stack of 12 books I pulled out of the library on the I Ching and fortune telling. Um, so that's what I ended up doing. Um, philosophy, right? And he even goes into the whole list of, if you don't know ma uh, natural philosophy, you don't understand how the world works, so you know, you're not going to get anything out of this. If you don't know uh, mathematics, you're not going to understand ratio and pattern and stuff like that, so you're not going to get anything out of this. If you don't understand theology, then, you know, they're probably going to end up speaking... Uh, the demons that you end up speak, uh, summoning will speak gobbledygook to you, etc., etc., etc. And actually, a good illustration of uh, this kind of general point is, uh, has anybody uh, read or watched any iteration of Faust? Uh, you know, it, it's kind of an easy thing to gloss over, but uh, basically at the beginning, you find a very bored man with four doctorates who's decided to summon Lucifer. <laughs> Not off the top of my head. If I, you do, go I for it. have pursued, alas, philosophy, jurisprudence, medicine, and help me God theology with fervent zeal through thick and thin, and here again I stand once more no wiser than I was before. Yep. So, one of the things that I find incredibly fascinating about magic is high magic is the province of bored geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean seriously. It's like if you think of exactly, and you know, th this is actually borne out in the historical record, right? Like you go to uh, the shamanic tradition, right? You know, there's kind of this interesting feedback loop between bending your cognitive processes and having your cognitive processes work better, right? It's kind of like you need the better than average cognitive processes in order to make the thing run to begin with, but then that feeds back on itself and accelerates them further, and then you get this creepy guy who can uh, yank his soul out of his body and go curse people. Um, one way of looking at it. But, uh, so I guess, considering that my particular area of research is how to, you know, optimize, accelerate, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, various, various areas of human cognition, I guess this is kind of what informs my approach to magic. Because, you know, I didn't get into it from the uh, ritual side of things or the historical side of things or stuff like that. I got into it from uh, the perspective of the 3,000 years worth of work on the I Ching, which is very workman from, from a uh, certain perspective, right? It's like one of the fascinating things about magic, right, is, um, you know, is this concept of the supernatural, right? Like, you think you are invoking forces beyond your control, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. you know, certain branches of magic. But the, uh, the I Ching was kind of just this matter-of-fact piece of existence in uh, life in East Asia for, you know, the last 3,000 years or so. And, you know, another thing that we get over here is magic, ritual, fortune-telling, and stuff like that tends to be the domain of specialists. You get the village-wise person. I mean, everybody uses charms and stuff like that, but, you know, like high ritual magic and stuff like that, Roman augurs, etc. But, uh, you know, when the civil service examination in China was implemented, Right, which was kind of uh, the SAT, the GRE, and like your high school placement tests all rolled into one unfortunate mind-bending package. Um, a lot of people got into fortune telling purely for stress relief. You know, it was kind of just like you know the world is uncertain, etc., and this idea that uh, okay we can figure out what's going to happen, right? We can figure out where we are in the grand scheme of things, what's going to happen, you know, the sort of calming background. So. Um, yeah, and then of course the other interesting thing is that the I Ching is not just a fortune-telling text, it's also a cosmological text, right? There's supposed to be um, reliable invariant patterns of nature in there. It's kind of supposed to be a macrocosm of the uh, microcosm as it's frequently going, uh, going over in magic. So I guess the uh, loosest possible definition that I'll go over for uh, my perspective of magic, oh, and I guess another interesting thing is... Um, if anybody's familiar with uh, Buddhist perspectives on magic, magical powers, and stuff like that, they're just kind of a thing that happens. Um, there's nothing peculiar or special about them. It's, uh, branches of Buddhism will differ on whether you pursue the flashing lights and the out-of-body experience or whether that's just a distraction to enlightenment. Um, so kind of just this very matter of fact, you know, it's like it's not heresy, it's not uh, this like dark, you know, you do do it in this dark room with uh, black robes chanting and summoning demons or anything. It's kind of just part of the world. Um, but, you know, and then especially the Mahayana tradition, you can do interesting things with things like out-of-body experiences, uh, the ability to shrink to the size of an atom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I guess coming to uh, the way that I'll look at magic is magic is largely about moving mental resources around. Um, 
in the loosest possible sense. I know like Anderson and I have gotten into conversations previously on how advertising is basically a uh, watered down and bastardized form of magic, um, unfortunately, because it's basically about moving your attention around. Hey, look at this. Or a highly refined and incredibly effective form of magic. <laughs> well, go on. Sure, sure. No, okay. <laughs> sure, let's go with that. I, 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 I don't want to ignore the moral component. Um, manipulating people without their uh, permission is immoral. Uh, that said, you are all now aware that your tongues don't fit comfortably in your mouths. <laughs> Sorry, obligatory. Um, <coughs> anyway, so, you know, and it's not just about moving your own cognitive resources around, right? And, you know, there's various ways you can do this. You can do it with symbolism, you can do it with ritual, you can do it with a giant association game that is sympathetic magic. Um, you can also move around other people's attention, right? Other people's memories, other people's done, like, you know, I think it's... What percentage of the population is suggestible again? Is it like highly suggestible? The numbers go like 5-10% in the highly suggestible category. And then I think it like bottoms up to like 20-25 for just generally suggestible. Anyway, but you know, again, basically about a quarter of the room can, or yeah, let, let's, let's call it a quarter of the room can uh, be suggested and, you know, 5% of the room, I could convince you that you were a newt. Um, it's a thing that happens. But uh, I guess one of the other things is magic is ultimately value neutral, right? It's a tool or a hammer like anything else. It's not inherently bad. It's not inherently good. Um, I guess this is me coming out of a tradition where magic was kind of just treated as a uh, thing that was there. Um, like um, Katarina mentioned uh, Onryoji, which was a... Um, the Bureau of Onryoji was part of the Japanese government for uh, several hundred years. And their jobs were, if I recall correctly, purification rituals and keeping track of the calendar. And the astrologers. Yeah, I, think, I guess that folds under mm. the uh, calendar thing. So basically it's just like, hey you, keep track of what the sky is doing. Um, which, you know, involves a decent amount of moving around your own cognitive resources, right? Like, uh, math can drive you crazy. No, it is, and I'm not just talking about the frustration that's involved in your uh, calculus exam. A friend of mine is a uh, math PhD at Stanford, and he once showed me the entrance exam to this extremely prestigious math camp that he teaches at. It's not a scrap of math on it, it's all lateral thinking puzzles. Anyway, so I guess that's my bit as the uh, non-Western, rather value-neutral magic person on this panel. So before we move on, I would like you to elaborate a bit on this thing that you touched on briefly, but I think is very important, especially for us here. We're all living in a Western context, regardless of the context from which we came. And magic holds a very different place in a Western context than it does in its Eastern context, as you mentioned. Right. Uh, it's more accepted. Would you elaborate a bit on that, the differences that you see in the social positioning of magic now uh, across the world? So one of the things that I find fascinating, honestly, about Western history is this concept of heresy. Right? I mean, it's not that Buddhism doesn't really have heresies, right? It's like, you know, Buddhists will persecute a bunch of people. It's that uh, Asia tended to be far more happily syncretic than um, places living under the Christian hegemony did. Like, there's this joke in Japan that uh, every Japanese is born Shinto, marries Christian, and dies Buddhist. Don't, don't know if you've encountered that one. <laughs> which is basically just summarized as, the, you know, they've retained most Shinto childhood rituals, right, which patter out about the coming-of-age ceremony at around 20. Um, they've heavily adopted Christian weddings because they're far cheaper than Shinto weddings. Um, and, you know, they're Western, they're fun. It's a wear tuxedo as opposed to this horrifically uncomfortable Junihito. Um, and then most funerals just happen to be Buddhist. You know, it's like they just borrow from all the uh, traditions they got there. And, of course, you know, one of my areas of research being the uh, history of the use of the I Ching, uh, one of the things that's funny about that is that literally any religion that cropped up into China had to deal with the I Ching at some point. It got to the point where um, when the Jesuits got there, they became convinced that like the, um, the I Ching was a garbled version of the Bible. Um, as, uh, if, if you ever want to read something really funny, it's like you should read... Uh, you know, writings and biographies and stuff like that, um, written around the time when the Jesuits went to China. Because the Chinese and the Jesuits found each other incredibly perplexing. You know, on the Jesuit side of it, it was, uh, 
how did they achieve this politically stable, you know, morally harmonious society without Christ? Um, shocking, I know. And uh, <laughs> the Chinese kind of went from, well, I think they had two major groups. What do you mean you eat your god once a week? <laughs> and, uh, oh, heaven, yeah, sounds great. Can I take my family? No, no, just you. Oh, well, who cares about that? <laughs> and so this notion of heresy in the Western tradition, what happened to that? I actually don't know. I think it's largely because this concept of a state religion was more lip service than anything else. Mm -hmm. may also have to do with the complete lack of a pope. In um, the East, you mean? Or in yeah, the West? Um, in, uh, in the East. And right. of course, then there's the uh, interesting thing of what your cultural unification principle is, right? Like, um, you know, there's... Uh, a saying, I can't remember exactly what it is off the top of my head, but basically the gist of it is that the Christian religion was the unifying principle of Europe. Right? It's like you could always rely on your neighbor being Christian. Probably. Um, certain periods of history that was a little bit more questionable than others. But that was kind of your shared cultural legacy, right? Your, um, it was the Christian legacy. You know, your, hey, your Bible, your Testaments, your sacraments, etc. That wasn't really the case in Asia. Um, the unifying cultural sphere was just Chinese imperialism. Because, um, you know, all the uh, literate elite wrote Chinese. I think a decent amount of them spoke Chinese. Novels written in Chinese were widely read. The Chinese Confucian classics were read. And, you know, Confucianism is, uh, to the extent that you want to call it a religion, there's a raving debate about that one, but uh, it's actually strangely agnostic if you go back and read the, um, if you go back and read like the Analects and other foundational texts where they don't really say a lot as to whether things like ancestor spirits, deities, and stuff like that really genuinely exist. They don't get into the metaphysics. It's more just, here's things that you should do to be a morally upstanding person. Um, so that might have something to do with it. There was far less arguing about what's going on upstairs. Right. A lot less standardization. Yeah, it seems. Well, I mean, there was more. I'd say there was more standardization of practice than there was standardization of belief. I could be completely wrong. I'm not totally special. Right. Story. No, I think that's a good point. Um, I might easily bridge us into something uh, additionally. You mentioned briefly theurgy, and I think you mentioned it also. Um, so I want to talk about this difference between uh, theurgy and theology, because it seems that uh, as far as the Western tradition goes, uh, everything that got driven underground and is considered magic nowadays is largely contained within this sort of notion of theurgy, uh, whereas theology is what became dominant and we have all of this God talk going on. Um, so if anyone wants to speak to the difference between these things and perhaps what they're good for, uh, I would like to open the floor for that. So just wanted to jump off one particular point that I, um, is that in in a time of like early Hermeticism and, and not just Neoplatonism, but also just these Hermetic movements that were happening in Alexandria, you had an enormous amount of syncretism that in fact was very comfortable, as you mentioned. It's, it's also a phenomenon that was there. You know, you had uh, the Greek magical pyre are, you know, you have these barbarous words that are essentially garbled Egyptian that was Greekified or like Hel Hellenized. And you have, you know, you have people in invoking the name of different names of the Jewish God, plus Osiris and Apollo and Hecate and all these other spirits and deities. And so there's, there's always um, a great deal of comfort in terms of make, synchronizing things in polytheism, right? You know, it gets more tricky when you get into monotheism because now you're excluding the possibility of certain other beings existing. And if they do exist, and they're definitely bad ones that are leading people astray from the real one. And so, you know, that, that's, that I, I think might also contribute to the thought of, like, why is more heresy prevalent in Europe, you know, or, like, why is that more of a concern? I think it's because it's in, in the Christian tradition, you do exclude the possibility of others, and if you admit that they're real, then they're demons, right? You know, they're, they're false gods, essentially, demons masquerading as positive entities. Um, as with respect to theurgy and theology, like I said, a lot of, like, early magicians in, in, in like, the Christian tradition were very much, like, in living in monasteries, you know, and so, um, and they were, you know, they needed a, th a theological background. Agrippa really stresses the necessity of that, um, and with respect to the idea of, like, you know, 
there was always a very conscious understanding of, you know, even within people who were very religious and did magic, you know, they knew, like, okay, there's a thing that's theology. Theurgy might be, like, lived or, an exp in a way, expressed, the uh, like, theology in a way that, you know, you're engaging with really the story of these spirits. You're engaging with calling the name of God and of Christ and binding demons under those names or calling down angels that serve God to learn things about him and to learn things because they're intermediaries, right? You know, it's a lot easier to speak to an angel than it is to speak to God himself. And so, you know, you're asking them to come down and to inform you. A lot of their uh, journal records, you know, you have people who say, this is the way that I am living through theology. This is the way that I am understanding it in a, in a lived way. This is the way that I am kind of doing my Christian duty, essentially, is to, is to work with these beings in a very profound way. Um, which is, they saw it as a, as a fulfillment of theology, essentially, as a kind of ritualized praxis. But they were also very conscious of people who were doing magic, but weren't doing what they were doing. And they would very much look down upon folk magicians, folk healers, shamans, uh, who were still operating in villages and so on. Um, and they would see them as essentially, not just corrupt, but they weren't engaging with it from this noble purpose of, that, you know, serves theology in a certain sense. So you have people who would say, oh, well, you know, these other magicians, what they're doing, you know, they're not doing it properly, you know. And they're, they're too concerned on causes and effects, you know, because um, while this may, they may have seen themselves as essentially, you know, polymaths who are remarkably well versed in not only mathematics and logic and rhetoric and grammar, but also in astrology, which was, you know, a real science at the time. And, and they were well versed in the theology, they knew the Bible very well. Um, they would, you know, say like, but that's, that's what enables us to do this properly because it is the highest kind of science, you know. It's the highest kind of metaphysics, essentially, that we can study. It, it's, it's literally putting the way the world works into a kind of ritualized practice and, and, and contributing yourself as an agent in that process. You know, you're actually like working with that. And then there were all these different questions about saints and when saints intercede, when you're praying to a saint and you light a candle for him and you ask him to please help you with this particular thing, when you bury those like, like, those like statues of Saint Joseph you can buy to sell your house and you like promise to burn a candle for him, is that just magic? Is that just basically hoodoo essentially? Um, and, you know, the, all those things aside, you know, we've had this debate going on, like, what we're doing is we're geniuses and, and we're, we're trying to engage with this. And then you have these rural, possibly illiterate folk who are getting paperback versions of Wormers, especially in the Bibliothèque Blau period, when you had the Franco-Italian tradition of Wormers mass printing them so people could access them. So people who bought them couldn't read them, and so they would take the diagrams. And so there's some research that suggest, suggests the use of circles in, in English witchcraft came from looking at grimoires and noticing there are circles. Um, and like literally copying symbols pictographically onto that. So like there's a, there's a whole debate in the history of it as to like who's really doing the real magic and who's doing like the, the folksy kind of like, and there's, again there's a pejorative aspect to that too. It's like, oh they're not really doing the high art that we're doing. The, the high and low distinction is of course very um, interesting to see a history of. So that's one option is really that, you know, in a way theurgy can be married to theology in the sense that theurgy is expressing or embodying or ritualizing theology because a lot of the, these people saw it as they're doing their Christian duty. Um, and of course, once you ask people who have very different perspectives, even within Christianity, it gets even muddier. But that's, I think, maybe a place to start. So I'm wondering, um, it seems that there's a historical trend as we get closer to the Enlightenment for certain practices to be narrowed out and rejected from what is within the core of Catholic tradition. Uh, is there a clear historical point where um, there's like a schism between this theory and theology distinction? Mm, off the top of my head, I mean, there was definitely um, periods of time where the thing is, is like when we talk about magic going underground, right, you know, of it kind of like no longer being accepted, it's kind of a bit of a false dichotomy because it's always been there. There's this kind of popular notion that post the Enlightenment, it falls away, you know, that, that it's now, that was a pre mod like in a way pre-modern understanding of the way of doing things and, you know, now after the Enlightenment people are much more interested in rationalism and, you know, deism where everything is kind of more detached, you know, and even and Christianity is developing to kind of not really see things in that way, especially with like the marginalization of saints and saint practice and saint veneration in the Protestant tradition, but that's not exactly true. In fact, according to Owen Davies, who wrote a wonderful book called uh, Grimoire's History of Magic Books, it's actually 70% of all grimoires, like black books of magic or books that manuals that teach you how to do it, were produced after the Enlightenment. Um, and it's not just because of the printing press, it's, there was a more demand for it. They would, you have, you know, all these texts from folk manuals to, you know, like, um, the Petit Albert to all these different new ones of the long lost friend in America, you know, they're all coming out of this, all the Cyprian grimoires from uh, Portugal and Spain and the Iberian region, they're coming post, you know, the Enlightenment. And so 
really it's, I think that um, one of Davies' conclusions in his book is essentially that really it's modernity that provides the most fertile ground for this sort of thing. You know, people are consuming them in, like, never before. There's no, even now, like, you know, you can go to any Chapters Indigo, any Barnes & Noble and see a New Age occult Wicca section, right? You know, it really is flourishing. And so I think that, um, you know, with respect to Christianity, there's so many different places you could locate it, but it never truly went sincerely underground. I think that, you know, yes, there were points where people would not distance themselves from it, but we don't always know if people had a private practice, that maybe it was no longer safe to express that they were doing it, because people wouldn't really, like, accept it as, as them living genuine theology. But, you know, they, they probably, we have, like, um, magician's manuals, you know, from the 18th and 19th centuries that were very much private, you know. Um, some exist in, like, the Royal Archive of Sweden. And, um, and, and, you know, and it also, you know, all these, um, in fact, another thing about grimoires is they were largely preserved thanks to um, antiquarian interests, not necessarily occult interests. So it's not that people were super fascinated in learning to do that particular magic, but there was a, an antiquarian book trade that was very popular, and these were wonderfully interesting like, leather-bound tomes or whatever like that they, they would collect. And so sometimes, like, one monk, you know, because, you know, if you're part of the aristocracy, uh, if, if one person gets to be the lord or whatever like that, or the prince, you know, the cousins will go off into monasteries. And so they would, when they die, the main person would inherit this particular library, you know. And so you have, you know, certain queens from England would have an enormous amount of grimoires in their libraries, but, like, they wouldn't use them necessarily, but they would have them and they would be preserved that way, you know. Um, and also in Sweden and in Norway, you had an enormous amount of grimoire traditions that were passed through militarized people, so police, um, soldiers, and so on, they still continue to use them in the 18th and 19th centuries. And you can really see that they were tailored to those needs because the spells don't have to do with gaining money, but more like your officer will like you, your bullets will always land, you will be impervious to bullets, or you will shoot straight, um, you know, you're, you will be promoted in the military, and so on. So, you know, it is, um, just touching on Davies' thesis here, you know, it is a thing that persists and in fact flourishes in modernity. It's just um, sometimes people have to be a bit more secretive about it, um, but it's not the story of like, and now it's lost and then people, you know, once you get to Arthur Edward Waite and, you know, Simon McGregor Mathers, like it's kind of rediscovered. Right, and that's early 1900s, yeah. late 1900s. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, yeah, do you guys want to jump in on that? Yeah. Um, you can fight it out for a <laughs> Who goes next? I, I've kind of just got a question. Okay. Yeah. Hey, but, uh, uh, kind of my interest is, uh, you know, by knowing less about the history of Western magic, would you say that there's, up until a point, actually not really a distinction kind of drawn between theology and theurgy? Because I'm reminded of uh, this uh, bit of Foucault where he's tracing back the history of science and spirituality. And uh, basically he says, uh, no, 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 science isn't what killed spirituality. Um, and he points to alchemy as a fine example of the uh, two co-occurring, you know, perfectly neighborly. He actually fingers theology as the uh, thing that finally killed it. Well, finally. But uh, kind of killed it off as a serious enterprise because his point is that the, uh, the pretense of theology is that you can access truths about the divine without the necessity of self-transformation, which is, I'd say, the essence of theurgy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, would you say that uh, our distinction between the two of them is almost anachronistic if I do somebody like I am with this? Sometimes, and it doesn't have a historical context, and I think it's it's interesting, especially when you look at um, the attitudes that different um, times in Christianity, different places have had towards it, you know, um, and the way that, you know, even some of the witch trials really began. Um, very much there's a, there's a very strong current of, well, you know, we are going to kind of strong arm people into being a kind of coherent believing unit, right? Because if you have some people who are doing mysticism, or who are trying to attain particular perspectives, uh, understand even like biblical literature or the story through a very personal affective way, that's going to be dangerous politically, right? Because now what if they discover some kind of um, insight that doesn't really fall within what priests are teaching, it doesn't really fall in what you know, you're supposed to be learning in your schools, that's, that can be an issue, right? It's and which saints, well, well, sorry, which people become saints and who become heretics can often be very conditional as to how accepted are they, not only in their particular society, because you know, saints would often arise as like, an exemplar within a particular community, um, who after their death would continue to be venerated, um, but and then eventually would gain a particular acceptance in the church, um, you know, it's also like some people, maybe they were a little inconvenient. Maybe some of the stuff that they preached was just not really comfortable for the institutions. And so that's another element of it, yeah. Verse Lewis gets into stuff like this, right? The, uh, <coughs> Verse Lewis gets into stuff like this, mm -hmm. right? The mystical state, etc. Yeah. There's a, a persistent, I mean, 
we talked about a transition point in some sense, or where you know the stuff goes under the record. The answer is it never goes under the record. Mm -hmm. Like it's just underground to some extent, kind of, sort of. Mm -hmm. And so it's like the general Western movement. Like periodically, somebody gets sufficiently rabid that they decide that they need to enforce monotheism in some strong arm kind of way, and it never ever works, right? Ever. You always get uh, saints creeping in the sides, or spirits, or intermediary deities, and right. And so, I think there is a kind of there is a kind of philosophical move, which is periodically made at whatever you want to call it intellectual levels, where people periodically want to push things. They're like, well, we can reason that things go to the one. And very often, in fact, when you see uh, a Neoplatonist resurgence, people start to move in that direction. But then there's the whole problem of the many, and so you get this, you know recurring over and over again. The church repeatedly, at one level or another, will get somebody who tries to draw a hard line, and they'll draw that hard line at Giordano Bruno, and they'll draw mm -hmm. it at, you know, right? The Inquisition will go around and say, we have to crack down. Um, there's a book I read a while ago called The Cheese and the Worms. Well, people know this book. It's super weird, and I recommend Hello, it. Ginsburg? Yeah, yeah. So it, it's about a guy who, during the Inquisition, uh, just suddenly decides, because of his own observations, that he has a cosmology to contribute. He's like, I get it. And he's a cheesemaker, and so he says, I understand, right? Uh, angels spontaneously generate in the universe, like worms spontaneously generate in cheese. Okay, so his knowledge of biology was a little important. <laughs> but, but, you know, as far as Aristotle was concerned, it's square, so fine. You know, and the point is, like, the Inquisition was having none of this, right? Now, we can imagine a period of time where, you know, very slightly different circumstances where that might have been embraced. Likewise, Giordano Bruno really got up in their faces in a bunch of different ways, right? Um, and so, you know, when they crack down on Bruno, they also crack down on a bunch of the sort of magical stuff that he's, he's pushing in a time period. But likewise, there's all sorts of people, monastery, right, in the monastery system who are, right, they are the ones preserving these texts. After the fall of Constantinople, when a lot of it surges back in and starts to come out of the libraries again, they're the ones that are, that are pushing this stuff. And ultimately speaking, right, there's a real thread within the church of interest in this material, problem is, especially as far as Neoplatonism is concerned, it's heretical because if at the end of the day you are capable of your own self-transformation, right, if it is possible for you to do things which allow you to transform yourself spiritually, the church is irrelevant, right? And the whole thing is, incidentally, this is why my mother is a heretic, because when I was a kid I almost died, and the priest told her when I was dying at like two, I didn't die, incidentally. <laughs> but when the, when the priest told her, right, the priest was like, oh, it's okay, you can baptize him in the, in the hospital sink. And when my mother told me this at like 15, I said, what? And she said, yeah, yeah, you know, I baptized you in the hospital sink. I said, that means I'm not baptized. And she was like, yeah, yeah, the priest said it was fine. I was like, well, the priest is wrong. Like, they fought wars over this. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a thing. Lay people can't conduct sacraments. So it's the same kind of thing. If it is possible for you to, through your own work, to enter a state of self-transformation, and if it is possible for you to influence things at a different uh, distance by putting yourself into a mental state, well then, Jesus doesn't have a lock on miraculous activity, and, right, self-transformation. So this is a thing that's always fascinated me, you know, kind of me reading, um, reading the Western history of magic, is that so much of it seems to hinge around this idea that we are naturally out of step with the divine. Right, you know, the whole fall narrative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, this is something that I was piecing together of, like, th th this was going down the rabbit hole of uh, what the church does with mystical experiences, because it really has no idea what to do with them. But, you know, and this is, this is what I was getting at. If you were going to lay blame on somebody, uh, I wouldn't even say it's necessarily forces within the church. A lot of that is reactionary. Yeah. If you're going to lay the blame at somebody's feet, it's that sourpuss Martin Luther. <laughs> <laughs> right? And the people that follow him. Granted, he was not happy with where the whole thing went, right? But basically, the Protestant Revolution starts to get this idea that you should not, you know, by your own efforts, yeah. be able to grow closer to God. And then, boom, at a stroke, all of this stuff is out. And, and wisdom traditions more generally, right? Also, I mean, ar ar yeah. arguably, you can lay most of the problems with Western history at uh, the feet of Martin Luther. Yeah. He, he did some good stuff, too. Yeah, he, he, 
Anyway, sure. <laughs> bra sure. Break the church's political power. Okay, and, that's one. Thing. And like, right. let's let's not be you know let's not be unrealistic. There is political expediency at work there too, right? <coughs> if you are on the outs with the church, you suddenly have an opportunity to sack the local monastery. That turns out to be very profitable. Like humans are humans, so we like to sack things if we can. But um, but yeah, that probably does more damage because those magical and and imaginal traditions, such as they were, were actually relatively well preserved, often in sort of coded forms. But it doesn't really matter. They clamp down over and over and over again. And the whole point is, right, people will go in and start ripping these texts apart, not even knowing what they're looking at. Or they'll just come up with the traditions from scratch, right? Because if we have some basic folk notion of magic, it's not hard for people to start to intellectually extrapolate out from there. And that's what they do repeatedly. So I see Katarina seems like you have, one, you have something you want to input. Just yeah. quickly, yeah. yeah. So on the, on the notion of, you know, you mentioned um, the, the heresy, so to speak, of baptizing a kid in the sink. Well, you know, um, in, in a way, in the Orthodox tradition, at least in Serbia, um, has largely like allowed magic to fairly flourish, um, unbroken in many ways uh, throughout many centuries. And the, the biggest reason for this was largely because um, the area was... Ottoman territory for a long time, which means that you know you're, the the church has not a lot of power because the Ottoman Empire is suppressing it, and so you know the, the last of its problems is whatever the folk and the villages are doing, right? So to this day, you know you have um, not only a remarkably well preserved like oral like lineage of, of folk traditions and magic and perspectives on mythologies and so on, the way that different spirits, which are possibly again no real historical confirmation on this in academia, but possibly pre-Christian have survived by blending into certain legends like the Nephilim or the Enochian uh, system and so on. Uh, not like Enochian, like John Dee, but like Book of Enoch. Um, but you also have, you know, like these sorts of things where in, in the village, you know, sometimes the closest hospital is too far away, right? So you even when you go to the priest and it's like, help, my son is sick, he'll be like, go to the shaman, you know, like, I don't, like maybe like, you know, or it's like, um, you know, how, I don't know, where in the Bible does it tell me how can I repel a vampire or a werewolf who is like, you know, eating my sheep? It's like, well, I can't point it out to you, but maybe that old woman who is has a really good track record of repelling werewolves can tell you, you know. So those things are very much like interconnected, you know, and it's, um, and none of these people would ever claim to be pagan, polytheist, um, you know, they don't really know anything about the neo-pagan revival in the West, you know, they would just say, oh, I'm Orthodox Christian, you know, um, but, and then there's this kind of understanding, which is problematic in its own sense in academia, of double belief, um, which is something that I'm quite fascinated by, but the very term of it is very problematic, um, because this idea that, you know, maybe you hold particular folk traditions that aren't necessarily Christian at the same time as you hold your Christianity, not necessarily, people don't see it as separate. They very much see themselves as like, I'm totally Orthodox Christian, but I know of these things, and this is how I grew up, and this is what I live, and there's a reality to it, right? There really are vampires and werewolves, you know, that can, you know, maul your sheep, you know, and you got to protect yourself from them. So maybe this psalm will help with that. Maybe this charm that you can make will, will assist with that, you know, or maybe calling upon a dragon, essentially, to protect you will do that. And so there's all these different things that, that go into that sort of tradition, but, you know, it's the, the history of it is not necessarily that, you know, if it's Christianity, it's going to suppress magic. You know, obviously we've talked a lot about how very much Christianity helped preserve many magic traditions and in fact you know saint necromancy so to speak you know is an excellent tradition uh, preservation of that and the early saint cults were amazingly necromantic you know to the core um and and many still are it's just that um there's a, there's an important understanding to be made that it's it's not um necessarily like divorce like it's not just that it can't be divorced but in some cases it genuinely is a part of that lived experience of christianity in that place the one thing that I like about studying this is how many great heavy metal titles come out of it. <laughs> I'm gonna, I need to go home and write Necromantic to the core. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it's interesting getting into this whole, uh, oh yeah, yes, I'm Orthodox Christian, but mm -hmm. then also holding yeah. these other beliefs, guys. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I've been talking recently to a uh, retired Unitarian minister who's decided to uh, make uh, <coughs> Calvinist heresy the object of his study in his retirement. Uh -huh. um, fascinating, fascinating man to talk to. But uh, one of the things that he said that was uh, interesting is that basically nobody holds actual Orthodox Christian beliefs mm -hmm. um, according to any system because uh, he says, uh, look, okay, with a five minute conversation with any Catholic on the Trinitarian doctrine, you can probably have them in front of the Inquisition within about five minutes. Um, just because, uh, you know, his mm -hmm. point is that nobody actually really understands what's going on there because nobody's going to bother to back read through Aquinas, Aristotle, uh, or Aquinas, Augustine, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it, re it really does kind of get into this question of what exactly is an orthodox belief anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to move on more 
explicitly on the question of the psychology of magic, because you know we know that at least when people are having these kinds of experiences, things are going on internally. We have talked a lot about the historical context about who has done magic across the ages, um, but I'd like to open the floor to the question, um, and the question can be answered in the form of defining a certain kind of magical practice or a cognitive faculty that is particularly useful for magical practice. But what are some uh, psychological, rational, naturalistic explanations that we can take for, let's say, summoning a demon or doing divination? And anyone who wants to start. Do you want to do demon summoning? Sure. Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, I already summoned Ross. There's your trick for That's a good trick. <laughs> okay, so sorry. Some some manner of like this psychologically naturalized sense of. Okay, yeah. let's let's just jump in with this. So, a bunch of the work that I'm uh, doing lately, I'm increasingly concerned with um, dissociation. So, dissociation is a really a widely observed um, psychological phenomenon. Indeed, it has entire sets of sort of therapeutic psychology built built around it. Uh, and there was a time when dissociation, even 30 years ago, was considered kind of fringy. So in some cases, when we talk about dissociation from a clinical perspective, we're talking about things like depersonalization, right? The, the sense that you are not quite there, you're not right, that, uh, or derealization, the sense that things are not quite real. Um, in its more extreme cases, people are familiar with the often sensationalized, right, phenomena around things like dissociative identity disorder, right, what we used to call multiple personality. Um, and it's become increasingly clearer as we look at the science around that these are indeed uh, legitimate phenomena, and in fact, far more widespread dissociative phenomena than we would have previously thought. So, um, uh, as, a, as a quick example, there's a thing called third man uh, phenomenon, uh, where people who are under extreme conditions, often in pairs, so Arctic explorers and stuff, right, will have um, spontaneously emerging um, experiences of voices or figures in proximity to them, right? Um, so often it's the idea that it's like the two are walking through and they feel a third with them. But sometimes that third communicates with them quite directly. So there's uh, an interesting case on record where a couple of people were ice climbing, for instance. Uh, and, you know, they're climbing up the cliff, the cliff collapses, uh, the, they're both sort of crushed under a mass of glacial ice. The, the one climber, unfortunately, is instantly killed, and the other one is just badly, badly maimed. And so he's trying to figure out basically how he's going to make his way back. He's so sort of crushed, right, physically, that he can sort of barely see. And he has this spontaneous experience where a voice, apparently external to him, very clearly tells him, right, here is what you're going to do. There's blood running off the end of your nose. So what you're going to do is you're going to let it drip into the snow, and you're going to walk. And if at some point you cross your own path, right, you will find the blood. And that's how you know you're walking in a circle, right? And that's how you're going to find your way out of here. And he did. Now, the thing that's interesting about that, and about dissociative phenomena in general, right, is that it has an apparent external reality. And, and again, we can leave aside the metaphysics, like maybe it was just his guardian angel at work, and if so, we've got that neatly wrapped up. But if you want to sort of play within the sandbox that psychology sets for you, generally speaking, you have to try to figure out a mechanism within sort of the brain or the mind or something within biology that would account for that. And it turns out that dissociative mechanisms actually do a, a pretty good job of this. Now, it turns out that dissociation is actually relatively easy to induce. So um, the whole early part of my academic interaction with the school, I got into a series of um, rhetorical fisticuffs with people trying to establish that hypnosis was a really real thing. Okay? And the reason is I had an experience when I was in high school. I was selling tickets to a hypnotist show, like a stage show. And uh, so that's fine. So I was sitting in the front row for the hypnotist show, um, and for the final act, right, the, the hypnotist, of course, does a standard suggestibility test, right? You find the highly suggestible people in the audience by saying, like, oh, I want you to close your eyes and imagine that there is a balloon tied to your wrist, right? And then the people whose arm drifts up, you know, they're suggestible. That's who you get on stage for your check and act or whatever. <laughs> so the, the final bit of this particular show, let me say I think stage hypnotism is insanely irresponsible now. But anyway. The final act for the show is, he says, okay, you, you know, you five people who are up here going through the show, you are in sea kayaks. You're out at sea. So you're kayaking out at sea off the coast of Alaska kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, you see coming up behind you a fin coming out of the water. It's like, doo-doo, doo-doo. 
okay, so, fine, there's a shark chasing them. So I'm sitting in the front row and I'm watching these people, and there are three people on the end, and they're paddling away, you know, but basically they're kind of smiling. It's like, okay, they're playing ball, whatever. There's a fourth person, and he is really, really working his phantom oar. Like, he is, he is going. And then this girl sitting on the end, okay, the, the fifth girl, is sitting there, and she's paddling her ass off, but also she's bawling. She's weeping. There's tears running down her face. And I sat there and I watched this, and I thought, okay, that's something. That's a thing. I don't know what that is. I don't believe the theoretical explanation that the hypnotist himself has provided for this. I don't believe him. I don't think that his language of explanation lines up with the underlying mechanism. But it's clearly something, right? It's not nothing. It's this person appears to be having an experience by all the evidence available to me, right? And that's an N of one, so not terrific science. But the person is having an experience by all appearances in which it's phenomenologically identical for her to being chased in a sea kayak by a shark. Like, what is that? All he did was talk at her. Well, since that period of time, there, about 10 years ago, the Raz Lab, who we're in contact with now, which is super yeah, cool. They're good people. Yeah, they're cool. Um, uh, so the Raz Lab ran a really neat experiment, okay? And what they did was, they basically they determined hypnotism is a really real thing for real. So uh, for those of you that are familiar with psychology, you know there's a whole cottage industry around the Stroop effect, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, you know, the you get a word, and it's a color word, like the word blue or the word red, right? And then the question is, is it also printed in the same color that the word itself says, right? So you might get the word blue, but written in red. And the whole Stroop effect, which is an enormous cottage industry in psychology, is just about the lag, the interference effect, when you ask somebody to name the color that they see as opposed to the word, right? And the idea is you have two interfering streams. So here's the thing. Advanced meditators can reduce their Stroop effect, presumably because they have some high degree of attentional control. But very few other things will reduce Stroop effect. However, you can reduce Stroop effect by hypnotizing people. And that's it. It's a well-established empirical effect. Now, what's going on for that to happen? Well, somehow, by the application of words, which are a lot more precise than people would have you believe, right? By words and leading people into a certain kind of attentional state, right, by directing their attention, you are able to somehow reduce the communicative integration that they would normally have with the module in their brain that reads. Something that is normally so automatic that it actually interferes with their ability to give you an accurate description of color, right? Like, that's why it's a whole cottage industry. You can do it with words. Just words. So dissociation, right? That kind of dis dissociation, and more generally, like, structural dissociation, has a uh, sort of a huge set of phenomena that are attached to it, right? And when you start looking at this stuff clinically, there's all kinds of different dissociative syndromes that come up. Now, I'm a, I'm a neo-Jungian, so I tend to look at this stuff often in terms of complexes and so on and so forth, and I tend to look at those things specifically dissociatively. Like, there are parts of your mind that are just running around on their own without you having much say about it. And those are the parts that generally screw your life up, right? Because they're running a little program. Often they're trying to help you, just to be fair. Incidentally, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, hypnosis is the only method of smoking cessation which is covered by OHIP. <laughs> and you know what they do when they do it? You go in, it has to be a doc. But they go in and they, they say to you, okay, I want you to go back to when you began to smoke. Because the first thing that they point out is an often overlooked feature of smoking, which is you didn't start smoking because you were addicted to nicotine. Right? You started for some other reason. You had some emotional reason. You wanted to fit in. You wanted to pass time. You wanted to get high. You wanted to calm down. You wanted to look more like your dad, whatever. Right? You had some reason. But the point is thereafter, right? Yes, there's an addiction that maintains it, but there's also this, this emotional underpinning that's running. So what they do in the hypnotic induction is they bring you back and they say, I want you to call up the part of yourself, right, that had this emotional motivation to begin with. And I want you to basically bring this part up, and I want you to say, thank you, I appreciate what you've done for me. Here's a medal, go home. Like, you don't, you don't need to do this. You're fighting a battle, it's over. I'm not 14 anymore. I'm not trying to fit in in the back parking lot. Um, okay, that whole model, if you think about it, is 
really kind of what's underpinning psychodynamic thinking in general, that there are these parts of ourselves, right, that are in some sense distinct from our regular consciousness, but they're operating within our minds. They have real effects, real effects on our perception, real effects on our actions, in some cases really dramatic effects, right, they can possess us and stuff. So, yeah, that's kind of where my work on that localizes. I think there's a lot more going on there, and some of the neurobiology and stuff around um, uh, Tononi, like integrated information theory, and there's a lot of cog side that I'm trying to flesh out around this stuff. But the point is, uh, a lot of my work, dreaming, lucid dreaming, altered states, magic, role-playing games, um, everything else I like, uh, more or less comes down to trying to integrate together this sort of dissociative idea, because I think that at the high end, like, you know, straight up, you can imagine things, imagine them. Right? But they have a reality unto themselves, regardless of, again, what you think about the metaphysics. So before we move on, I want to get you to talk a little bit about um, actual magical practice you refer to a lot when you talk about this dissociative thing, which is that of assuming the god form. Mm -hmm. uh, can you describe that a little bit for us? Sure. Um, so there's lots of different methods of, of this, but in general, right, you, so if you're assuming the god form, you know, there are various forms of this, but it's an imaginal technique, right? So it's a kind of active imagination or a structured imaginal technique, often embedded within a ritual framework where you want to have sort of a system of correspondence guiding your visualization, but also hitting you with a bunch of um, sort of aligned sensory elements and so on and so forth. And the idea is that, you know, in many traditions, your astral body or your light body is relatively plastic, right? You, it, meaning you can sort of sh uh, change its shape through imagination. So very often what you are doing, for instance, is you are conjuring up, and you find this in a bunch of different traditions, you're conjuring up a highly stabilized version of a deity with particular traits, a deity or a tutelary spirit or something, uh, and then you are stepping into that. So somebody I know, actually, who is a, was a long-practicing Buddhist, um, was Vajrayana, he was within a Tibetan tradition. And I was talking to him at one point, and, and he was like, you know, we barely studied meditation um, when, when I was coming up. And I was like, what did you do? And he was like, mostly we like adopted God forms. We, we donned the God form, right? And he was like, so for instance, at one point in my training, uh, I had to adopt the God form of Shiva for a year. A year. And I said, uh, what was that like? He was like, it felt good. Was like, yeah, I bet, I bet. And I bet you were like a terror for road rage. And I'm sure you were intolerable to your colleagues. But anyway, um, no, no, no uh, uh, slant against Shiva, don't get me wrong. Um, so, yeah, it's, so the idea is, I mean, if you were looking at it from this kind of, the kind of dissociative perspective I'm talking about, in some sense you're constructing this thing outside of yourself, right, in some way, or you're calling it up, constructing it, calling it up, whatever. Uh, and then you are donning it, and thereby you are sort of absorbing some of its qualities and bending your own mind, your own nature, right? You are t taking something from it, but also operating through it. So, and there's a lot going on there, obviously, but yeah. Does that answer the question? It does. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to bring some of that into some uh, actual magical practice. I think you did a good job. Mm -hmm. It seems Jin Sung would like to comment on No, I was just going to offer to uh, play with the definition of the thing. So oh, please, yes. Um, so uh, I guess I'm also going to be running largely off of unconscious processes, um, except in this case, rather than the unconscious processes that make you you, or Shiva, as the case may be, um, they're the processes that alternately make you incredibly smart and incredibly stupid. Um, because, you know, the uh, computational metaphor that we occasionally apply to our brains, right, is not totally wrong. See, the problem with computers is that they're the ultimate three-year-old, right? They'll do exactly what you ask them to. Exactly what you ask them to. Um, and your brain does something similar, interestingly, which is, uh, so this goes back to some work, uh, I think the first citation of it is uh, 1967, uh, Arthur Rieger. And um, this is the uh, concept of implicit pattern recognition. So, Reber's original experiments used artificial grammar, where basically he would create uh, sample strings and uh, say, okay, um, so this set of sample strings is grammatical, right? Like, um, basically they're like arbitrary uh, sets of letters put together in like false words and stuff like that. And uh, so, he gave you the training set, right? And said, okay, so these are all, uh, these are all grammatical. And then he would give you a set of 
other strings and say, okay, I want you to uh, tell me which ones of these are grammatical and which ones of these are not. And people performed well above chance. People are incredibly good at implicit pattern recognition. And then he asked people, now, how did you do that? And a lot of people would, uh, you know, they'd like come up with rules to describe what they did. And most of those rules were bullshit in the uh, technical sense of the word. Uh, thank you, Harry Frankfurt, for uh, your wonderful donation to scientific language. Um, so basically, like, it turns out that if you took the rules that people said they were using and actually applied them to differentiation, most of them did not work. Actually, if I recall correctly, none of them worked. Um, so people are incredibly good at this sort of baseline recognition of patterns in the world, and very bad at describing what those patterns are. Okay? So... That's piece number one. One of those things that the pattern recognition abilities that people have at the low level let you do is pattern completion. Right? Um, so who here's taken an IQ test? Out of curiosity. Okay, a decent portion of you. You notice that a lot of what they have you do on an IQ test is simply pattern completion, right? Because, um, you know, humans' abilities to predict how the world is supposed to behave is pretty foundational to our ability to act intelligently in it, right? So, one of the things that those low-level pattern recognition abilities let you do is actually predict what's going to happen next. But, you know, it's like we don't want to just describe the world, we want to be able to predict what's going to happen so that we can orient ourselves within it. Okay? So, essentially what I'm getting at is every human kind of at base has some minor ability to predict the future. Largely statistical in nature, not necessarily terribly reliable. Right? Because, unfortunately, you can also pick up on patterns that aren't actually there. Um, you know, people who have more, I guess, plastic cognition can pick up with, uh, pick up even more necess not necessarily existent patterns, stuff like that. You know, this is partially where paranoia comes from. Um, you know, you start thinking that the world behaves a way that doesn't necessarily schizoid personality, um, stuff like that. Anderson can speak more to the clinical end of this. Um, so, from my research, most of what divinatory practices are doing, and I'm more familiar with the I Ching and Tarot, but I think they all work on fairly similar principles, is they're using a second weird thing your mind does to kick those basic pattern recognition systems into overdrive. And another one of uh, the other weird thing that your mind does is you are all far more synesthetic than you think you are. Okay. Um, so one of the great examples of this is actually the uh, Stroop effect where, you know, it's like, we develop this kind of association between symbols and things, right? So between, like, the letters R, E, D, and this, uh, this color, right? To the point that reading the letters R, E, D and not kind of experiencing this color are incredibly difficult. You know, this is why it actually takes work to pull the Stroop effect apart. Okay, um, another great example of this. Oh God, I'm going to do a John die. Um, are you going to draw the die? No. No, <laughs> no I'm going to do this one. Uh, let's see here. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hearing from the audience that uh, some of you have seen this one before, but I'm going to ask you to do something weird. Name these shapes. Which one's Kiki and which one's Bubba? <laughs> No, ser seriously, which one's Kiki, which one's Bubba? Left one's Kiki. <laughs> okay, left one's Kiki, right? Why? Booba. It's uh, spiky. It's sharp. Yeah, so, so what is it with the K sound and the sharp thing, right? There's no actual association out there in the world between the K sound and something being sharp. It's the synesthetic thing that we've kind of put together. Okay. So, one of the things that you can do with more information is predict bigger patterns, right? And one of the things that synesthesia lets you do is connect more information, right? Like, um, synesthetes tend to have actually a pretty good memory because they're able to associate more senses to something. Um, and of course, the other interesting thing is, as it turns out, you can actually learn synesthesia. Like, um, was it you who was telling me the most common form of synesthesia um, is uh, color letter synesthesia? But the reason why so many people have that form of color letter synesthesia is because it's the color of the Fisher Price refrigerator letters, um, which have kind of just invaded our culture to the point where we form these bizarre associations with them as children. Um, 
There's all sorts of examples like that, but also um, yet another case of advanced meditators having weird brains. Uh, advanced meditators also usually develop a form of synesthesia. So th this is something you can learn, or at least develop over a long period of time. And so then what you're doing by learning synesthesia is you're learning to connect more dots, as it were, right? Like instead of using one association to connect two objects, you're using multiple associations to connect more objects, right? So now let's jack this into something like tarot cards, which are absolutely loaded with imagetic systems, right? Or uh, the I Ching, which is loaded with mythological, poetic, historical... Um, <coughs> I think textual analysis of the core text of the I Ching have turned up like historical events, children's nursery rhymes, poetry, um, stuff that would be familiar to somebody in that cultural context, um, regardless of whether you'd have direct experience of it. And tarot's similar, right? Tarot plays on a lot of the uh, Western cultural inheritance. Um, so that lets you form associations between particular things, right? So, you know, there's a lot in an I Ching reading or in a tarot draw that you can form associations with. And if you kind of unfocus your mental eyes, as it were, right, you can start seeing the full scope of possible associations. And this is another reason why I find the association between magic and huge amounts of information fascinating. Because the more stuff you know about, the more associations you can draw, and the kind of bigger a uh, divinatory net you can cast, right? So once you've kind of cast that giant web of associations, that little bit of your brain that does a bunch of weird implicit pattern recognition can go nuts, right? Because you've fed it a huge amount of information. And now here's what gets into another interesting thing is, um, so this is the work of uh, Robin Hogarth. You can actually get better at intuition. It's completely trainable. Um, it's not, I'd say, teachable insofar as somebody standing in front of a uh, classroom and jabbering at you is not necessarily going to improve your intuition. But you can improve your intuition by putting yourselves in situations, that's the word, um, where you'll get very tightly coupled error signal, right? So basically you have an intuition, it will immediately tell you whether that's right or wrong. Okay? Now, you can do this in one of two ways, right? You can either seek out situations where the feedback is immediate. You know, let's say um, in a tarot consultation, right, where you'll get feedback from somebody else's reaction spatial features, right, refining your own intuition further. Or you can simply make the feedback that you get from the environment louder by, say, altering states of consciousness. So there's a bunch of ways that you can play with that machinery, but uh, that's, from what I can tell, kind of the psychological machinery that's going under divination. I can just bounce off that real quick. Um, so it occurred to me that a nice, succinct definition for oh. magic while you were talking was, that, that I like, that I'm not going to commit to, uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, Skillfully bullshitting yourself to fruitful ends. I mean, that's, basi that's basically the Raz Lab's entire right. uh, research project. But one thing that I will say in this respect is that, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, I kind of came, came of age in some ways in chaos magic and I've shifted away from it. And one of the reasons that I've shifted away from it to a great extent is um, the sort of super abundance of symbolic systems that you get if you start to try to take these things in in a sort of all-consuming, eclectic fashion makes it much harder to navigate these spaces. So if you internalize everything you come into contact with, you a little tarot and like a little this and a little that and a, you know, 12 different systems that were originally sort of culturally contained, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you can go back and forth on the question of whether or not that's you know, cultural appropriation, that's a whole separate issue. But when you've got 12 systems and you suddenly encounter something, you, you don't have as much um, structure to sort of channelize the way your associations move. And so I think it makes it much more likely when people do have a kind of omnivorous eclecticism around this stuff that they're going to kick over from useful magical consciousness such as it is into just schizotypal thinking. Uh, where you are, you start drowning in symbolic associations because there's 20 different ways that you can interpret everything, and it just connects and connects and connects with no useful way to 
constrain or contain it. Um, and most of the practitioners I have met who are effective um, have really locked themselves in on one, like they've committed themselves to a set of associations, even if they're interested in other systems. It's like they practice in this particular way. Um, whereas, yeah, likewise, like I'm surprised I'm still sane and alive too. Yeah, but actually, if I can uh, kind of use another example of a uh, complex system of psychotechnologies to learn. Learning a martial art basically works the same way, right? Like people who dabble don't get nearly as far as somebody who sticks with the same thing for at least five years. Right. Um, there's a good quote by a Tai Chi, a tai Chi teacher or something like, uh, the best style for you is the one you practice. Just like, you know, it's like, no, collecting bits and pieces of various traditions is not going to help you. Pick a thing, stick with it, start seeing results, then go on your eclectic journey through everything else once you know how at least one thing works. Did you want to weigh in on a practice, category? Sure. So uh, my background is not in psychology, it's much more in history and anthropology, but um, one of the things that um, is fascinating, plays on what you two have touched on, is that historically, if you look at the journals of various different magicians, um, often, especially within a grimoire tradition, which is now seeing a bit of a renaissance in terms of like modern occult circles, you're having all these different people who are translating grimoires, who are making them available in hardcovers and paperbacks, so you can actually like have them and, and, and discuss them. You, especially ones that include um, marginalia by actual practitioners, to say, oh, by the way, this is what worked better for me. The spirit showed up when I did this, and the grimoire says this, but you know, the way I did it seemed to work better. Um, is that they, they often note the necessity of sticking to a particular one. It's not that they don't think that that's the most effective one, that's the best one. It's the Gromorian Verum by far better than, I don't know, like the Goetia. Not true. You know, no one, no one really claims that. It's more that they say that, you know, you, you stick to it and you do it really well because the idea is you keep going until you get results. You don't have a, you don't, there's a, there's a major emphasis right now in circles that I'm exploring for my work in emphasizing, like, you have to actually get a certain result from it. You can't convince yourself that, you know, well, I felt kind of good. I felt a tingly feeling, you know, so now it's okay. I, I succeeded, you know. It's like, well, you know, did the, did the thing that you wanted actually happen, you know. And often that comes from a sort of dedication or practice. Looking at Avermelon, which the French version, I believe, is like six months. The German version is 18. That's not a crazy amount of time to dedicate to something as boring as literally, like, praying in a closet. You know? yet, yeah. It's the backup system. It's the backup system. Because yeah. fir his first son yeah. gets got the Kabbalah. Kabbalah. Yeah. And he's like, I yeah. uh, can't give you Kabbalah, the first son got first it, so Kabbalah, here's yeah. a backup system so yeah. you can do worldly magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the idea is that um, it, it's, the boredom of Avermelon is actually part of it. It strips you down, it makes you isolated, it makes you vulnerable. You know, it, it gets you to a state where you're frightened and alone and you don't really have, and talking to people who have done it are saying, you know, it was crazy, my marriage almost fell apart, you know, all this other stuff happened, you know, it was, um, because I didn't have a social life, I just had to go straight home and do my prayer, and then the next few months I had to do even more prayers and so on, you know, these purifications. And then finally it gets to a point where they're trying to get their holy guardian angel, you know, and they're basically, in a way, spiritually naked. Like, they've just been cleansed and they're ready to receive something without projecting sort of their own neuroses onto what comes. And that's kind of the idea of commitment, is essentially, especially with meditation. You know, you're not going to get good at it unless you practice it. You know, you do, um, and even though it's uncomfortable, like, I've almost met no one who says, oh, I really enjoy meditation, it's just like... Few people truly do, and the ones that do, I'm very skeptical. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm joking, but like it is a, it is hard, you know. Like you know, martial arts are difficult. You know, all these things take time to develop, and there's a real um, beauty in sort of developing the skill. But I do think that eclecticism can be valuable, especially in living in a, a world that's so pluralistic and really encounters so many better, beautiful traditions. Um, much beauty has come out of syncretism, and that comes from eclecticism. Sometimes that happens because of colonialism, and a lot of these other, like like I said, Afro-Brazilian traditions. You have Catholicism blending with indigenous Brazilian traditions, blending with mythology and ways of working with spirits from the Congo region, from the Yoruba people of Nigeria. Area. And and these are these were you know artificially in a way came together because of colonialism, but organically certain practices arose. Sometimes under the threat of the church, you had to hide the spirits you were working with, so you would say, never mind, it's it's this saint actually. Don't don't pay any attention to what I'm doing, you know. But on the other hand, you would have people who um, you know at the, at the end of it, you know, were actually like, you know what, the saint um, really helped. Uh, these spirits, you know, it helped not just, it's not necessarily a face for them, but he helped us hide them in a way, you know, and so we're going to keep the saints, so we're going to keep the saint statues on the altars now, you know, so, um, and even though now they have different cultural systems to kind of draw from in their recognition, they also have, um, in a way, uh, a way of dealing with multiple different beings, um, especially when you get grimoires that come into Brazil, often they would look at, like, the Guarimarium Verum, and they would say, oh, there's a spirit called Lucifer, there's a spirit called Astaroth, you know, and Beelzebub, maybe there's a 
will incorporate those spirits into our tradition and say this is where they are now. Um, and that's actually a very similar to, you know, in a certain way to the early Hermetic tradition. Because if you look at the Greek magical papyri, you know, the, these series of spells and texts, you know, it's, it's really hilarious, this shotgun shell approach at getting a spirit to actually like, listen to you, right? It's like, I don't really know where the spirit's from, but, you know, I'll, I'll like throw in a bunch of names. Here's like five names of the Hebrew god, here's like Apollo, here's Poseidon, here's Zeus, uh, let's throw in some Egyptian ones, here's Anubis and Thoth, you know, and maybe the spirit obeys one of those things, right? You maybe like the spirit actually like is a, is a member of a legion or in a particular way, um, it's very much associated with uh, that being or follows and the retinue is part of their court, so to speak, you know, and it's like, and maybe if they hear that name, they will bow, you know, in a way, or they, they'll listen to me and be like, oh, you know my boss, I'm coming then, you know, <laughs> um, and, you know, like, networking with them, so. um, and then, uh, but on the other hand, with respect to, this was a while ago, but you mentioned assuming God forms, right, you know, so many of those traditions, including rumors, start by you saying, I am Moses, you know, or I am King Solomon, you know, and so, you know, the question is, is the spirit really going to buy that you're Moses or King Solomon? Maybe not, but maybe the idea is you're stepping into a tradition of being like, this is a character who had a particular power, who had a particular ability to be recognized by the spirits and, to, and, and that they will heed their call, you know, so when you step into that particular channel of power, however you see it, um, you're, you're in a way, um, it's not a role play anymore. In, in, the, in the moment of that ritual, like, you know, you are taking on a particular authority, you know, and it's not, um, you're convincing yourself that you're someone you're not, but rather you're actually, like, um, in a way, speaking to the spirits in a language that they understand. At least that's how many of these magicians that, you know, um, frame it in that way. You know, it's, it's kind of like, um, when you're in France, and you speak to your waiter in a little bit of your really terrible French, you know, and they go like, haha, that was cute, okay, let's switch to English now, but now they know you and they're kind of nicer to you, because they're like, at least they tried, you know. That's kind of how sometimes I've, been, I've um, you know, encountered stories, especially not just through practitioners' journals, but, you know, reading books by even modern magicians who put out material on how they've encountered angels and different spirits and elementals, uh, working with different traditions, from all the way from Franz Barden's stuff to, you know, early, you know, Renaissance grimoires, is you have people who say, you know, in a way, um, it's not a faking, it's more like it's showing a courtesy. I mean, you're engaging in a particular language, a set of souls that have been established by a tradition. And so, and when you engage in it that way, they're like, okay, you made the effort, now I'm coming through, you know? But that's, just because there's an element of tradition that's really beautiful there, doesn't mean that innovation has no place to ro role to play. Because if we didn't have that, then none of these syncretisms would have ar arisen. Everyone would be so fixated on purity, like, of tradition, that, you know, there would be no room for these sorts of things to grow. And I think that's really one of the most fascinating things looking at these things now, is when you have people who are coming at them from a young age, just through culture, just through seeing these things in media, you know, already with so many pre, like, um, how do I put this uh, more delicately? Essentially, just all these things are already in their head, you know, from media, from books, um, Harry Potter, you know, had a, funnily enough, like a huge impact on, you know, like, 90s Wicca, you know, and so on, and basically, like, and people are coming into that with that, you know, some traditions will tell you, okay, abandon all of that, we're spending the first few years just meditating and kind of learning the principles of this new thing authentically, but sometimes that can actually really help inform particular people in terms of, like, this is where they're seeing connections in their own culture and also with other ones, um, and it's helping them inform a more holistic understanding of spirit contact. So essentially, like, again, it's the historical kind of point of view is that there's so much, um, helpful information in both, you know, looking at something and studying it very seriously, and that's how the Evermelon works, but also looking at syncretic traditions uh, that thrive off of not excluding, but including new spirits and including new ways of working with them in the pursuit of more authentic spirit contact, but also in the pursuit of essentially, like, learning about more things, you know, which is one of the things that excites people often, you know, when they enter these things. It's like, aha, now I have something new, not to play with necessarily, but to encounter new beings who uh, may have very new perspectives. Thank you very much. So, uh, I mentioned we'd have some time for questions, but uh, we got a little carried away. Uh, so, we have a few options. Uh, this was only booked until 9, technically that's what it said in the event. Um, so, we can have a break and return for some questions, or we could just do a 10-15 minute round of questions, uh, and then disperse and talk and have conversation afterwards. So, I'll leave that up to the room. Uh, who would prefer to break and have a longer discussion? Okay. <laughs> We can talk later. <laughs> All right, so let's do about 10, 15 minutes uh, of questions. Um, hands up, and we'll start. So you're quick. What would you like to say? Um, I, I was curious both uh, sort of historically about this as well as sort of using the um, scalpels of Cogsci to dissect uh, altered states. You kind of touched on the idea of magical consciousness. 
um, and to whatever degree, you know, whatever, as you kind of said, your metaphysics might be about whether there's actually gods over out there, but maybe there's angels in here. And so that, that as an altered state, different from everyday consciousness, how does that influence sort of magical traditions? Is there like, I, I don't know, like uh, somebody's made a list of like, okay, well, with these traditions, you get this kind of altered state, and these, you get this, you know what I mean? So I'm just about historically. I mean, I mean, I guess this is the giant common core debate in uh, the psychology of mystical experiences, which is basically the question of, is there kind of this core set of experiences that we can re refer to as mystical experiences that are kind of just endemic to the way that the human brain is set up. And people just explain them differently culturally. Or is every tradition set of mystical experiences a truly unique thing? Um, you know, I, I'd say it differs. Well, I, I can't really speak to the practitioner side of things, but I'd say it, the opinions would probably even differ between practitioners, whether uh, they're kind of like possessive of their mystical states and say, no, no, no. You only get here through our tradition, or you know, if they can kind of do what the uh, what the Onmyoji and the mm -hmm. uh, shaman did and just talk shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, those are conversations that happen on so many different levels, and it always will be kind of unique. I think that because um, even within it, the same tradition, right? You have people who say, "Well, I did the rules. I, I did my training course. Essentially, like I studied with this one person for a long time, and I achieved this result." You know, and that's uh, inherent to the system. Right? You know, it's, it's a product of the system, it's something that makes it effective. You know? And then you have people who say, well really, anyone could really arrive at this through different methods, it's just that this one really is because I engage with it and because I plugged myself into the symbol set, that's how I achieved it. Um, but they see it as a very much a common thing that, in a way, hermetically is almost mankind's birthright. It's, it's something that, you know, you have that kind of eternal spark of your soul that resonates with, you know, the nuos and, you know, that's, and you're achieving a kind of dialogue between those things. Again, like I said, it really depends. Um, and even, and, and also keeping in mind that there are grades to those states. Um, in certain like African Caribbean and African Brazilian traditions, you have understandings that there's you know there's different levels of possession. You know, it's not always the spirit is just fully in you and you black out and you don't remember things. That exists. They, they, there are those states. You know, where they say you know the spirit has fully possessed the person and. <coughs> You know, they black out, later on they don't remember it, and they have to kind of come to and remember what actually happened. Um, and the spirit was totally in control. And they have ways of testing that usually, to make sure the person isn't faking it. Usually by speaking in a language that only the spirit understands and the host doesn't. And seeing if the person responds fluently, and if not, they're probably faking it. But if it's true, if, it, if they are responding in that language or completing a particular aphorism from that culture, then the spirit possession is valid. But it's also double-headed possession, which is like when you're all, you're still in your body, there's a spirit that's sharing it, and sometimes it's you coming in and out, and the spirit coming in and out, and you have more control because if the spirit is doing something that's unproductive or unhelpful or is causing a, basically some kind of chaos in the particular um, group, the meeting, you can shut that down. And you know, spiritualist churches are, and, and spiritual traditions are contending with that. You know, they're like, how much do we let? Them speak through us. Is it only in the context of the ceremony when we're all at the white table, or can you know people do it on the streets? You know, if they have a court of spirits that are protecting them, you know, can they just have conversations with them like that? You know, is it something they can filter in and out? And how do they build the mental muscles to differentiate between their own impulses and their own, um, I guess you could say, intuitions about things, their own assumptions, things that they can feel good and validated, even if it's petty and and it's just like you know. I don't like this person, and there's something about them that just really like frustrates me. So like that's clearly like you know them, you know. Or is it maybe a spirit who's saying this person's actually bad news, and you got to be careful, you know? So people often train particular muscles, so to speak, in the brain to kind of work with that. Listen, spiritual traditions. I think that there is a small but non-trivial number of human cultural psychological universals. So I think that it's not a very big number. I think that lots of states of consciousness, broadly speaking, uh, emotions, mental phenomena, etc., are highly culturally inflected um, and, and culturally determined. But I do think that there is a small subset of actual human cultural universes. I mean, you know, whatever. To whatever extent we want to get into that kind of essences talk, right? Um, and within those, you know, there are a few, like, I sometimes like to talk about, uh, just as one way of looking at it, like uh, uh, Jak Penksepp's um, theories of uh, effective neuroscience, right? And so he talks in obnoxious all caps, talk, in obnoxious all caps about different sorts of circuits within our mind, you know, the rage circuit, the play circuit, the so on and so forth. Um, 
you know, when we talk about these things and we think about how the sort of different levels of cognition have a way of um, synesthetically, and synesthesia isn't just um, a question of having a crossover between sensory modalities, right? It's a crossover between any kinds of modes of processing. So, like, an example that I think is really interesting uh, that I heard of is a case where uh, a kid was having a lot of uh, trouble with math, with arithmetic, and it turned out that the issue, it seemed, was that the kid had um, a synesthetic association, a natural synesthetic association and crossover between um, numerals and personality. So when asked questions like, what's four plus seven, their response was, oh no, four and seven would never hang out together. <laughs> right? And that caused like a lot of problems. Now, I had only ever heard of one case of this, but I was actually lecturing at Incog 250 the other day, and somebody excitedly ran up and was like, I have that! Uh, what were they? They said, I always thought of nine as being kind of a bitch. <laughs> and I was like, that's super interesting. Um, anyway, so, you know, the point is that synesthesia is about all of these kinds of cross-modular processing. So I think, you know, you can start with a very small core of common psychological universals, right, in some sense, right? And just by connecting those things together and connecting together certain axes of universal processing, all of a sudden you actually get a profusion of common states and therefore common language, you know? It's an old saw that when you have a, an interfaith conference, right, like classic case, you, you get together an interfaith faith conference of uh, you know, Buddhists and Christians, right? And all the Buddhist priests eat lunch together, and all the Christian priests eat lunch together, and all the monks hang out. <laughs> because the monks are the people who are primarily concerned with, right, this, and they've got lots of things to talk about. So even, even if the language differs, and even if indeed there are sort of a, a menagerie of culturally individual and culturally mediated sorts of, of states. So I think that there is a kind of common core, um, and that operating through that, that common core of, of states gives you a really wide range and access. And my sneaking suspicion is that because of the potential of combination, recombination, plus cultural material, plus all these different crossovers, like, there are altered states that have never been. You know, we haven't exhausted this, this <coughs> space yet at all, uh, right? There are new altered states. There are new mental states. There are emotions as yet undreamt of. Um, and I think that 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 space is actually sort of part, in some ways, I think that is sort of the, the cognitive legacy of magic, right? Is that you're, you're pushing out into a, a undiscovered country, not in this case, death. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of undiscovered country leads to death. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> like the Arctic. Yeah, like the Arctic. Being an explorer is not a great retirement plan. <laughs> or it's a fantastic one, depending on your point of view. Depends what you find. Yeah. So do we have any other questions from the audience? Uh, let's go you in the middle. Can we speak a bit about magic, mysticism, religion, and mental health? Ooh, those are big questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Sure. Thanks, Annabelle. Way to put us on spot. <laughs> okay, sorry. Magic, mysticism. Oh, just like magic, like mysticism, religion, like all of that as a whole, or whichever parts you want to address, and then mental health. Okay. Uh, so many people, in my experience, have various forms of um, mystical experience or altered state experience, and because of the way our culture deals with these sorts of things, they tend to sort of auto-stigmatize themselves, or they don't know what to do with what's happening. There are some exceptions to that, right? Um, and so one of the things that I like about depth psychology and about sort of neo-Jungian practice is it is able to engage these things phenomenologically on their own terms. You don't have to necessarily agree with the underlying explanation to take seriously what's happening to people. And when people get hammered with this kind of symbolic material, especially when it's like an out-of-control flood, like, they very often don't know what to do or how to navigate it. And there's useful stuff just coming to them and being like, look, you know, I, I'm taking seriously what you're saying. That can be a huge starting point for people who feel like they're being swept away. In general, uh, in my opinion, um, I guess having trained on both sides of the line, um, psychotherapy is magic that cut itself off at the knees. And so, and like there are some therapeutic tra traditions that recognize this, and some countries where this is like 
it's like a sideline thing. Like Chile is doing all kinds of weird stuff. Um, but you know, in general, there there's this kind of thing. To some extent, we've moved away culturally from um, broad umbrella systems of psychology and psychotherapy that are sort of philosophically oriented and provide a whole life kind of solution, and we've moved increasingly to technique, right? So CBT is good for lots of things. It is. It's good at sort of what it does, but what it does is, right, a little bit. And, you know, that even, you know, it's squarely derived from Buddhist thinking and Stoic philosophy, right? It's just mind-changing technology. The thing is that the way that it applies itself is very narrow. And the way that it looks, right, the way that lots of therapies now look at how they do what they do is sort of like, no, no, the quest for legitimacy is about moving all this stuff to the sideline. So they have nothing to say about some of these broader phenomena. But in my experience, like, you know, experience is strange, right? And like most people, if you get a few drinks into them, will tell you about weird stuff that has happened to them. Strange things that have happened in their mind, weird experiences they've had. Some of the most rational people I know, like really squarely hardcore rational people, have told me some seriously weird stuff. Last Friday was fun, wasn't it? It was awesome. <laughs> it was good, yeah. We, the the Kogsai uh, folks all we went for cider. And uh, weird stuff came spilling out. Um, irrationally. Um, Some of it was cider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, long story short, you know, magic and mysticism are of a piece that's a continuum. It's a false distinction to look at it otherwise. And as far as mental health is concerned, I think we need to do sort of more mining in some sense of these traditions to find out what's going on and then, you know, what my personal project is, is to some extent naturalizing and refining this stuff because we've come up with lots of techniques but we're not done. Like if we were, it would all work all the time and it sort of works sometimes. So I guess if I, if I can also weigh in on this, like I think, you know, you, you've got to hit the nail on the head with the, uh, you know, it, it, this is going to sound very, very strange coming out of a secular scientist's mouth but I think atheism was a mistake. Um, or at the very least, the way that like the new atheists have kind of taken it and warped it such that like basically if it's not materialist and measurable, it doesn't exist. Um, because then most of the things you care about don't exist. Okay. Um, and so, you know, there's a, uh, there's a master's thesis that uh, my supervisor sent me to read that was on spontaneous mystical experiences in atheists. And, uh, no, th th they happen. Um, and it's a problem. Because they don't know what to do with them most of the time. Because there is nothing in their, you know, usually secular scientific worldview that accounts for this sort of stuff. Actually, we, uh, we just sent in a paper on uh, mystical experiences and meaning in life. And the two things that are predictive of the relationship are how coherent the mystical experience was for you after the fact, and whether or not you interpreted it in a religious fashion. So basically, it boils down to, do you have a system or a framework that you can use to understand what just happened to you? If not, this is completely useless to you. Um, and this is what happens to most atheists, right? So I think this is kind of one of the reasons why we need to have a serious scientific psychology of mysticism, magic, altered states of consciousness, religion, and stuff like that. Because we need to have something in our increasingly secular worldview that comforts people and tells them that they're not crazy. Um, now... You know, I think we've gotten a lot into the relationship between magic, religion, and stuff like that, and pathology. I think it does a lot of good for people as well, right? You know, it's like, these are tools that you use to sort out what's going in your own head. Um, you know, it's um, psychotherapeutic care is the thing that science, religion, and magic all have in common, right? You know, this, don uh, this notion of care of the soul. Um, and the techniques that they all use are pretty similar, you know, the, oh, well, okay, the uh, therapist has their one set of techniques. Um, I've got this uh, book that's a uh, Anglican confessor's manual um, that kind of goes into basically how to use your borrowed divine authority to give people absolution to help them through their struggles, um, which is interesting. You know, magic basically does the same thing. Hey, let's pull something out of your head and see what happens. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's like, I think that these are legitimately important things, because while magic can break people's minds fairly easily, it's also the main tool for stitching them back together. And, you know, that's not even getting into what the uh, religious belief that the universe is generally benevolent does for people on a day-to-day -day basis.
I wanted to jump off something that you said about the healing factor of magic yeah. because you know often like especially in a very secular very materialist society you have this notion is like if you're hearing voices you're crazy right you know if you're having mystical experiences then something's wrong with you and we got to figure it out and diagnose it and just kind of like make it into this thing that you're ashamed of essentially you know and I read a book recently on Espiritismo in Cuba um, sorry, in Puerto Rico, and it was um, very fascinating the way they were, you have these people who were, from a young age, were having experiences hearing, not just not just hearing spirits, because that was kind of accepted in certain communities anyway. It's like, well, duh, because, you know, our ancestors do talk to us sometimes, so we'll talk, we'll talk back, you know. But it was specific people who were struggling with um, confronting things that were just very amorphous, they were having a hard time grasping them, it, they weren't able to confront them in a way that was conducive to their mental health, and they were, you know, they were getting anxiety over it, they were having issues, um, speaking or articulating necessarily what's going on to them. And so some people would, would, you know, interpret that kind of nervousness that suddenly, you know, my son is fidgety and he won't look me in the eye and he's grumbling on about these things that are plaguing him, you know, some people see it as possession and so they go to an exorcist to try and like get it out of them. You know, but some of these um, people that I was reading about, they were like, okay, well, maybe you're picking up on things that other people don't really have the faculties to pick up on yet. You're, something about your brain has, or about your kind of nature is more intuitive psychically. You know, some people might say it's brain plasticity, but you know, for that person it was a kind of psychic ability that was untrained. And so they would take them to be initiated into people's <coughs> system, psychopanda, or they would take them to a spiritist gathering, and they would teach them to a spiritismo, where they would be able to kind of sit down with an elder and set up crosses of water and candles and communicate with their spirits in a kind of um, organized way that, you know, within in, in front of them now they can kind of control the events individually and begin to structure it in a way where they can encounter these very confusing things that can often, like I'm not going to downplay it, like some, some of this stuff was traumatic for people. It was, you know, um, not just like, not necessarily like um, they were hurt in the process, but you know, it was confusing. It was like, it was like having someone else's depression in a way, you know, you just didn't know what to do with it because you felt so alien from uh, and distant from it, but at the same time you were experiencing it so viscerally. And and them being induced to these traditions and being taught their ways and learning ways of interacting with these beings helped them become not only like, in a way, more solidly grounded people who were much happier and they would report, you know, we, the book had all these little like, reports of people who were discussing, you know, after 10 years of this, you know, I feel so much better, I still hear voices, I still communicate with spirits, but, you know, I, I at least now um, I have a way to do it where I feel safe and I can put an end to encounters that are spiritual, that are uncomfortable to me, that I don't want to have at this moment. I can find a way to not aggressively, like, berate the spirits, but assert my own boundaries, you know, because, like, you know, I am my own spirit and my own body and I want to make sure that, you know, the line, just because I have this faculty doesn't mean that it's going to be blurring all the time, making me feel uncomfortable, you know. And so really it's, um, those, some of those systems really are, in a way, validating their experience. They're not saying that they're not happening, but they're giving them tools to kind of approach it within their cultural system. You know, so I'm just talking about one particular case, but it's within their cultural system that is helping people flourish. So it's, it's the exact opposite of saying these people, because they're now getting into a system where speaking with spirits is legitimized, you know, are getting more crazy. They're actually getting healthier in a way. You know, they're getting more grounded, better at asserting their boundaries, better at understanding um, their interpersonal relationships with other people, embodied or disembodied, and also just in being able to kind of take control of this faculty that they have, however your metaphysics defines what is actually happening to them. Um, perhaps it is helpful to keep that in mind, that they're not invalidated immediately and just told, like, well, you're crazy, you're nuts, you know, whatever, you know. It's like actually, like, Take like yes, something is happening to you. Those people have a very that particular group of, in a way, spirit contact is a very way a particular way of understanding that and contextualizing it and giving you tools to work within that system. But the fact that maybe the, 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 the when you begin with it, it's not immediately like okay, let's go to the exorcist and you know just kind of like beat it out of you. You know, it's let's confront that. Let's let's explore. It, let's see it on its own terms. That I think is quite helpful. And that, apropos of our host, the Jungian Society. Um, I always think in this context of uh, Jung, Jung's position on the question of religion, which I actually think is, I think it's the best position on this question. So I'm biased because I'm a Jungian, but it's a Jungian society event, so that's okay. <laughs> so, uh, and here it is. Jung says basically, okay, that the question of the existence of God and the existence of spirits in the spiritual world is, is, it's not, you can't establish this. There's no epistemology for it. There's no evidence. There's no evidence that you can have, like in a logically rigorous sense, that is going to definitively establish for you the existence of God or the non-existence of God. It's not the kind of question you can answer. Right? 
So whether or not God exists or spirits exist or don't exist is just, that's not what evidence can you get. You can get certainty, but as anybody who knows me knows, certainty is not worth much. Um, however, as Jung points out, it doesn't matter. Because what you do have, pretty empirically established, is people have these forces, whatever they may be, in their experience, in the field of their experience, whether you take that as being mental or objective or whatever, right? People have these experiences. They have these encounters, as he puts it, right? Confrontations with the unconscious. They have these encounters with seemingly autonomous other forces. And the thing is, at the end of the day, these things speak a certain language. The language is symbolism and a ritual. So either you can cut that stuff out and leave yourself, frankly, deeply screwed up and unable to grapple with this large portion of your own life experience and like so on and so forth, or you can start speaking to them on, your, on, on the terms that they actually understand. And, I mean, it requires, I think, for you know, many of us situated within the West, there's a certain like, jump that you have to take because it all feels so weird. But uh, the point is that that's essentially, in some sense, that symbolic, analogical, ritually structured language, Jung's point is, that's what they speak. That's how you communicate with this stuff. And so, yeah. So I actually want to bounce off of that, too. Like, one, I guess, last point on this uh, particular uh, dead horse, which is, you know, th this stuff is a part of you, right? Like, the uh, susceptibility to ritual, susceptibility to symbolism and stuff like that. And here we are in a university context where a big deal is made out of being critical consumers of information, right? You don't want to leave yourself susceptible to fake news, false information, all this other stuff, right? So a lot of what you're taught is critical thinking skills, you know, fact-checking, etc., to make sure that you're safe from, to use Frankfurt's lovely technical term, bullshit, okay? And a lot of people, further on top of that, take things like, you know, cooking classes to make sure that they can feed their bodies effectively and, you know, not fall susceptible to things like malnutrition. And, uh, you know, on top of that, some people take self-defense classes so that uh, physical situations, or, you know, at the very least, work out so that physical situations are not beyond their control. But we as a culture have kind of let our control of our own symbolic processing fall by the wayside. Right, so, you know, it's like, uh, there's this great book Anderson put me on to that traces the uh, history of advertising back to Renaissance symbolic magic. Um, so one of the problems with this kind of having fallen by the wayside is we as a culture are now even more susceptible to symbolic and emotional manipulation than we have been previously. And that's a problem. See our neighbors southward. <laughs> We could go all day on this, but can I can I just put in on one closer point based on <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, the uh, the book in question, incidentally, for everybody who's interested, is I own Quiliano's Eros and Magic in the Renaissance. It's an yeah. awesome book. And yeah, sorry. sorry, it's I own Quiliano's uh, Eros and Magic in the Renaissance. Uh, there is a copy at Robarts, but it's never where it's supposed to be. So good luck with that. <laughs> um, but uh, so. Kuliana makes this really interesting point. Basically, there's like this tradition within sort of the, the Neoplatonist revival, right, of the idea that you can use imagery and symbolism, right, to control eros, your sense of like salience, attention, and attraction to things, etc., etc. And, you know, so uh, Kuliana points out that Giordano Bruno, referenced earlier, proposes at one point, it's like, you know what would be way better? than the system of government where tyrants force us to do things at the end of pointy, sharp objects. A system where instead, we just deployed like symbols and ritual in a way that made people want the things that we want them to want. And then that would be how we would lead. That would be good. And so Culliano points out that that, then developed through propaganda, in turn developed via Edward Bernays, right, uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew, the inventor of PR. Go watch Century of the Self. Uh, you can watch it for free on YouTube. Gets us to the modern sorcerer state, which is where we all live. And, you know, when I said earlier, like, maybe advertising is just, in fact, a highly developed and effective form of magic, albeit dark magic. Um, I mean, there's something to it. We flipped over into a modern world where, like, we have to keep buying shit that we do not need, or the entire economy will fly apart at the seams and everybody dies. <laughs> That's basically what they tell us, right? Keep buying new colors of iPhone. Keep doing it. 
because if growth slows down even a little bit, meanwhile, we're drowning in our own waste, right? And, 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 and. We don't need to even get into that. But the point is, right, how has that occurred? Well, it's occurred through PR. PR is mobilizing the image system. So, you know, I'm not so sure that the magical tradition is as lost as we think. And we have to ask ourselves when we talk about the loss of the poetic and analogical tradition in our culture and, and our sort of abdication over symbolism here to a great extent, like, has everybody abdicated their control over symbolism? And who does it serve? So get yourself good and magicked up. It's revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I think that's a good note to begin wrapping up. Uh, one thing we didn't touch on, which is maybe the subject for a future uh, panel, is what are the personality traits of people who are disposed to magic? And I think that question has something to do with why none of the magic books are ever where they are, or they're in super secret libraries that you can't write down. <laughs> <laughs> or they're written in code, or, you know, in indecipherable symbolism, right. or they're written in gibberish, or... Or they contain intentional symbolic landmines to keep away the curious. Yes, so high open <laughs> complex people. <laughs> Anyways, thank you all for coming. Um, Next week, we'll have a talk on Halloween at 7 o'clock, I think, called uh, The Satanic Trinity. I'll be talking about my favorite symbol, the devil, uh, and maybe I'll see some of you there. Otherwise, good night and thank you. Did I already ask you? You must are going to be getting together at the Red Room for a no, few drinks, and you're all invited. Red Room's at College of Small. Okay.